So let's set the scene with the action from the Fed yesterday and what it means for you. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by 25 basis points, bringing the target range to four and a half to four and three quarters percent. The Federal Reserve is raising its benchmark interest rate by a quarter point, putting it in the range of four and a half to four and three quarters percent. The decision was widely expected by economists, and it's a step down from recent increases, since inflation is starting to slow and the Fed has decided it doesn't need to be as aggressive. But just because the Fed's tapping the brakes, that doesn't mean it has plans to pause rate increases anytime soon. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2%. Today's announcement will have an impact on the U.S. economy and your bank account. First, the Federal Reserve's interest rate policy is tied to borrowing rates and made big waves in the housing market in 2022. Higher mortgage rates means higher monthly payments for people buying homes now. And since the central bank began lifting rates from its pandemic era low, mortgage applications have seen a steep decline, plunging 40% in the last year. Second, you may have noticed you're earning more money in your savings account. That's because rising interest rates push up yields for savers, with some high yield accounts now earning more than 3.5% annually. And last but not least is the Fed's ongoing battle against rising inflation. Chairman Powell reiterating the central bank will do everything in its power to fight rising costs, saying it won't stop until inflation is subdued. That'll be a relief if and when it works. In the meantime, the Fed's hikes are rippling their way through the economy and your wallet. So that brings us to thing number one today, the disinflationary trend and what it means for markets. So can the Fed actually achieve a soft landing? Of course, we've said it time and time again, dual mandate for the Fed, maximum employment, but at the same time, price stability. They are prioritizing that price stability, even as we get a wave of employment data this week that actually seems to give them a little bit more actually cushion for their understanding right now, or at least their pathway forward right now, Saz. Yeah, I do want to point out, though, I know the market, uh, it was really enthused. You know, we saw that reversal as that press conference by Jay Powell took hold. I just want to remind investors out there that does, this doesn't mean that we're seeing deflation. That is not the same as disinflation. That's the first thing. Next thing, uh, I, I don't think the Fed chair p said or, or pivoted to that we are getting rate cuts at some point this year. What he essentially said, they may not be raising rates any more past that March meeting. So that's a good thing as well. And also let's keep in mind, we're focusing on what this all means to uh, people's money, is that rates are still going to be high. There, there's an, likely another rate hike coming. Uh, and this is still a Fed that is trying to slow the economy down. What does that mean? It'll cost more still to buy a car, to buy a home, and to do a lot of projects around the house that you might have uh, planned for. So again, this isn't a Fed cutting rates. It's just the Fed maybe being a little less hawkish and the stocks embracing that. Yeah, I mean, trying to boil down a very complex issue and all of the ripple effects that a Fed a rate increase has. But just to, like, just to further explain on what we're talking about, there's inflation, there's deflation, and there's disinflation, right? Inflation is when prices are going up. Mm -hmm. Deflation is when prices are going down. Disinflation is when prices are going up at a slower pace. So say if year-over-year -year inflation goes from 6% to 2%. Right. That is disinflation, and that is what the Federal Reserve wants to have happen. So essentially what Fed Chair Jay Powell was doing was acknowledging that, yes, there is some disinflation, whether it's directly because the Fed is raising rates and that's having an effect, or also because of the supply chain effects have been abating, right? So, yes, maybe your car is more expensive, although some of the car prices have been coming down, as we well know, saw. So it doesn't mean that you're going to be paying more for everything. It means things are going to be more spotty this year. And then, of course, there are the implications for the market, which is a whole other ball of wax, right? And now certainly we see, and we certainly saw in the reaction yesterday that you were pointing out, Brad, that investors are now looking beyond this interest rate increase cycle to the end. Maybe they're a little bit more hopeful that there's not going to be an outright recession and maybe not a severe one. 
And that's where some of this optimism is all coming from. And perhaps on the mindset of the consumer, too, they might be thinking about where wages may stay elevated in order to offset some of the price inflation that they've already incurred right now, too. We saw that in the ADP data and then additionally thinking out to the jobs report data. Keep a close eye on the wage growth figure that we've continued to bring to your attention here. And within the most recent report, yeah, 4.6 percent. But continuing to think about where you're seeing some of that job migration in and post kind of the great resignation era, now looking at some of the layoffs that have come forward, some of the hiring freezes that have been initiated for employees that are or prospective employees that are still looking for jobs, there's still a multiple of roughly two for them to figure out what kind of job they want in the economy and then ultimately still be able to make sure that their wages that they're taking in are elevated and offsetting the pace of inflation that they had seen and then the disinflation as well, perhaps, that, uh, that they're expecting to continue uh, at this point. So the Fed raised rates once again and by the expected 25 basis points. Chair Jay Powell reiterating the plan of ongoing increases, but stocks seem to be largely shrugging that off with Powell's comments on disinflation lifting demand for risk assets. Here to discuss, we've got Sonia Meskin, who is the head of U.S. Macro at BNY Mellon Investment Management. Sonia, thank you so much for taking the time here this morning. Your perspective on what Powell had to say and, and quite frankly, what the markets are giving weight to as well here today. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. So I would say the big takeaway from this um, from this meeting was really the press conference. And within the press conference, it was the fact that Powell basically did not validate slash somewhat dismissed the SCP from December, i.e. the dots. Secondarily, he didn't push back against the recent easing in financial conditions, but I think the most important part was that he essentially said we're not really committed to the dots in December. And the December dots were a big hawkish move for the Fed, um, where they really took, um, if you recall, they really took their estimate of the target rate for the cycle um, to 5%, if not higher. And the fact that he kind of dialed that back, essentially dialed that back, uh, was the is really what I what I think is behind this market rally, and so, so you know does that now mean soft landing, free and clear? That's the base case at this point. Well, I think it really doesn't really. It's it's the one episode in the saga. It's not necessarily the end of the saga. I would say um, that certainly he talked a lot about everything that the uh, the market already knows which is that goods inflation is coming down. We're really having goods disinflation, which is the mirror image of what we were having when COVID first hit. It's certainly being helped by China reopening. Um, we are having, we will be having some disinflation in new leases and shelter in general, um, at least um, in the first half of 2023. Um, what's happening with services inflation overall is still uh, a big question. Now it's all about really about the labor market. And the question for us is really, well, do, do they need to have the labor market weaken substantially? Um, I have a recession in order to contain um, services inflation and kind of really nip in the bud that potential for a wage price spiral um, that is still out there. Or is this just going to happen on its own? Sony, despite the uh, Fed sounding a little more dovish yesterday, they still raised rates. The ECB, they raised rates today. So did the B of V. Yeah. Do you think all these rate increases by global central banks still has the global economy on path for recession? Um, I would say not necessarily. We really had in each of these economies is somewhat different. Uh, we had a big shock to supply and demand coming from COVID that is still being kind of worked through. Um, I think that in the U.S. specifically, uh, supply and demand is still not in equilibrium. Uh, Powell did allude to that multiple times yesterday. Um, and the imbalance is still quite evident in the labor market specifically. Where that new equilibrium will be, will it be at roughly the same place where it was pre-COVID or somewhere different, um, is really quite crucial to, um, to policymakers and to the economy overall. Uh, but they don't really know where that will be. And they're erring on the side of of caution, e.g. on the side of being dovish right now. Sonia, we got to leave things there for today, but we certainly do appreciate the time. Sonia Meskin, who is the head of U.S. Macro over at BNY Mellon Investment Management. Sonia, thank you again. Thanks for having me.
All right, the breaking news. Jerome Powell just gave that speech after the eighth rate increase this year, 25-point basis hike, and he reiterated that language from March of ongoing increases. Our own Jen Schomberger is there. She was there for the entire speech. Jen, nice to see you. What was your biggest takeaway from the Q&A session? Hey there, good afternoon, Dave. Yeah, Fed Chair Powell striking a hawkish tone yet again, uh, saying that while inflation is, has come down the past three months, they still need to see more substantial evidence that it is coming down on a sustained basis. Fed Chair Powell saying there's more work to do and that the Fed could raise rates higher than what was previously projected back in December of that range of five to five and a quarter. Take a listen. We think we've covered a lot of ground and financial conditions have certainly tightened. Uh, and I would say uh, we still think there's work to do there. We haven't made a decision on, on exactly where that will be. I think you know, we're going to be looking carefully at the incoming data between now and the March meeting and then the May meeting. Um, I, I, uh, I don't feel a lot of certainty about uh, where, that, where that will be. It could certainly be higher than we're writing down right now. If we come to the view that we need to write down uh, to, you know, to, to move rates up beyond what we said in December, we would certainly do that. At the same time, if the data come in in the other direction, then we'll, you know, we'll make data-dependent decisions at coming meetings, of course. Powell said we could get back to 2% inflation without a significant downturn in the economy and without a significant spike in the unemployment rate. He says that the committee right now is, uh, and that his, I should note, he does not see cutting rates this year. He reiterated that again. Now, Powell said the committee is not exploring resuming raising rates after pausing, as Dallas Fed President Lori Logan had perhaps indicated in a recent speech. On the wage price spiral and the potential there, he agreed agreed with uh, Vice Chair Brainerd that he does not see a wage price spiral right now and it's less of a risk and that as inflation continues to come down and people see that, then that could help with sentiment there as well. Now, Powell did address failure to raise the debt limit, saying there's only one way forward and that is for Congress to raise the debt ceiling that any deviations from that path would be highly risky. He says this is a matter to be resolved uh, by Congress. This doesn't involve us. He ultimately believes Congress will act on this. Back to you. Jen, what about the comments in regards to a recession? Because it seems like Powell once again remaining pretty optimistic, saying that there was a good chance that we might be able to avoid one. Yeah, he seems to have a different outlook than the market does. He says his base case scenario is that we basically have that soft landing where um, the unemployment rate doesn't spike that much and the economy doesn't have a significant decline. To his credit, that is what we're seeing right now. Uh, there are some signs flashing red, though. If you look at the manufacturing data out this morning, uh, we'll get a jobs report on Friday morning. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, the Fed has projected uh, just half a percent of growth overall this year, but that would still technically be positive. Uh, so he, Fed Chair Powell, very firmly staying in that camp right now of no recession this year. Of course, we'll see how things play out. The private sector certainly believes otherwise. A hawkish tone, but the markets see it otherwise, don't they? They are very much in the green. Jen Schomberger, great job. Thanks so much. Check in now with former Federal Reserve Board Special Advisor and Dartmouth College economics professor Andrew Levin. Nice to see you, sir. So we'll give you a blank slate there, your reaction to the expected 25-point hike and the language ongoing increases. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that the... Um, there were a few minor updates to the statement that they issued at two o'clock. The quarter point hike was no surprise at all. Um, so the real challenge here is for Chair Powell in a few minutes to explain more about their thinking. There has been a lot of economic news in the last few weeks. Um, so it's really important for him to give an update um, how their thinking is evolving since the last time they met in December. Remember, four times a year, the Fed issues a fresh set of economic projections, but this is not one of those four times. So it, it puts more, a little bit more <laughs> weight on, on, on the remarks that he's going to make. Well, Andrew, how has your thinking evolved since the last time we spoke? Because when we spoke then, you were saying 6 to 7% for the Fed's funds rate. That wasn't out of the question. Has that changed since we have gotten some economic data that has shown that the economy has eased a bit? 
I think that there has been some good news, and so I try to keep an open mind here, <laughs> not to get struck in a rut. Um, I think the, the good news is that um, the, some of the measures of inflation, and even the latest measure we got um, yesterday on the employment cost index, looks there's some sign that nominal wage growth might be starting to edge down. Um, I, I think we need to wait several more months to see some more employment reports uh, to get a, a clear handle on it. It's complicated because there's a lot of different kinds of workers and the workers who are coming back into the workforce. Uh, we saw it this morning in the in the latest, uh, it's called the JOLTS report. Um, still a lot of workers quitting their jobs, moving to a different job, probably because they want a cost of living increase and they couldn't get it from their previous employer. So the challenge for the Fed is that if workers continue to want to get cost of living increases for the big cost of living increases they've faced in the last couple of years. Um, firms are under pressure in a strong labor market to do that. Firms got to pass those costs on to um, into their prices. Then we see kind of inflation getting entrenched. And so I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that the Fed still needs to raise further but I think probably the latest data gives them some breathing room. Maybe they'll make one more quarter point hike in March, and then maybe they can wait a few months to sort of see is the service price inflation coming down the way they've been hoping, um, or is it staying too high and that they need to tighten a bit further to really make sure that inflation comes back to earth. So we're about 10 minutes away from the most measured speech since Tom Brady's retirement this morning. What are you listening for, Andrew? Well, I think that um, uh, some investors have been really worried about the risk of a recession. Um, the latest consumer data we got for December doesn't look so great. Um, uh, the, the distinction of is the economy just flattening out, kind of taking a pause, but it's going to pick up speed again, um, or does it look like it's teetering on the edge? And so I'm sure that Chair Powell is going to get questions about this today. Kind of what do Fed officials see as the risk that the economy is going to slide into recession, and how is that influencing their um, policy plans? And those are going to be really important questions for him to address. What do you think about the likelihood of a recession in 23? I'm hopeful that that's not in the cards. Um, uh, the, the, the disposable income's actually been pretty strong, and that's, of course, helped as workers get cost of living increases. Um, gives them some buffer. Um, another good news about the, the 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 inflation that we saw in some you know parts of the of, of uh, the economy um, has definitely subsided, um, and the rent prices are starting to show some signs of of slowing down. Um, so consumers get some breathing room on the cost of living. Then that means that the income increases they get will go further. So um, hopefully people call it a smooth landing. I was a little bit skeptical about that a few months ago. I think there is um, some more positive signs. Um, so one good case for the Fed is smooth landing and inflation continues coming down and the workers have enough cost of living increases that uh, wage costs start to, to flatten out. Um, bad cases for the Fed, which are still possible, is the economy slows a lot but workers are still getting hefty cost of living increases and inflation is still you know, stubbornly high, um, then the Fed has to make some tough decisions. Yeah, Andrew, let's talk a little bit more about the labor market and the dynamics at play there, because I think everyone's been scratching their heads trying to figure out the fact that it has been so resilient, what that signals in terms of what's ahead, if it, in fact, will ever break. And some Fed officials have voiced concern that prices could potentially reaccelerate because the labor market is so tight. How valid do you think those concerns are at this point in the economic cycle? Okay, I mean, these are really great questions. And again, we'll look to Chair Powell to see, <laughs> see what he's thinking. But, but what I would say is, first of all, we look at the weekly jobless claim numbers coming in week by week, and those are still very, very low. So we, there's lots of headlines about a few high tech firms that are laying off workers. But for most of the economy, particularly in the service sector, they're desperate to hire. And in fact, this morning's report, the job openings went back up again. 
Um, so a key distinction here in the economy is residential construction is lousy. The housing sector got hit really hard by the increase in mortgage rates. Manufacturing sector is facing some challenges. Um, the service sector, they're looking for more workers, um, and that's where they need to give cost of living increases. Um, and that's where the labor costs are a big part of the prices that those firms charge. So I would say that the labor market's strong, but it's not overheated. Um, and that's an important distinction. Um, it means the Fed doesn't necessarily have to hit the brakes um, if the cost of living increases can slow down a little bit as workers are, are catching up. Um, then maybe this will all work out fine. Uh, the harder, much harder situation is the one where inflation's still running two or three times the Fed's target. Um, the Fed may have to do more. To your point, these layoffs have mainly been isolated to the tech sector. We got some more news today uh, out of uh, the automobile sector. Other than Hasbro and 3M, maybe a handful of names, it has been where that's really just 2% of our workforce. Do you think they will begin to spread in the months ahead to the economy as a whole? Um, again, I hope not. I will point out that Walmart, which is a huge employer, just announced a few days ago, really big cost of living increases, which I think it's great. The, the people who work at Walmart um, deserve to get a decent pay. Um, but those pay increases are on the order of 10, 15, and 20% for these um, hourly workers who you know, used to get paid $12, now they're gonna get $14 an hour. It's still, these are not greedy workers here. Uh, they're just getting a fair pay, okay? Um, but the point is, Walmart is a, is, a, is a sign of the service sector of the economy. The hospital workers, there's a lot of other workers who've had really big cost increases in their cost of living. They have to tighten their belts. And those workers um, should be able to get cost of living increases. That creates the challenges we're talking about with these wage price dynamics. Andrew, what is your read on the consumer? Because the retail sales, they pulled back over the last couple of reports that we've gotten down three of the last four reports. We've gotten some data out from Citi this morning of their credit card data showing that overall spending is at its weakest point that it's been since April 2020. How big of a, I guess, how material of a pullback are you seeing in the consumer data and what that signals? Well, one of the challenges with this data is um, in normal times, when the economy is kind of humming along, um, we see normal seasonal patterns. Um, so usually in the past, you know, the consumer spending was very strong in November and early December in the lead up to the holidays. I think part of what happened last fall, <laughs> for a number of different reasons, was a lot of that consumer spending happened in October and early November. Um, um, another shift that's been happening lately is um, pe people um, spending less on goods and more on services. So the, these things make the, the, the data more complex to read and more complex to interpret. As I said before, the consumer data definitely has shown some signs of faltering, but with disposable income remaining strong, I think there's a, there is a, a, a reasonable hope that consumer spending will be resilient this year and that we're not we're not they're not we're not that close to the edge of a cliff. Recession fears continue to mount and leading indicators are pointing toward further economic weakness. But what would be the tipping point that actually pushes the U.S. into a recession? Great question you ask. Joining us now to break that down is Liz Ann Saunders, the chief investment strategist over at Charles Schwab. Liz Ann, great to see you this morning. And thanks for taking the time, as always, uh, particularly within your 2023 outlook. I, I was particularly interested within this that you've described as a rolling uh, recession or a recession of the rolling variety. Perhaps you can break that down for us. Yeah, and that's unique to the, the COVID cycle. So if you think about the point at which stimulus kicked in, you had this pent up demand, but because we were still in some form of lockdown, all that demand was forced to be funneled into the goods side of the economy. That then became the breeding ground for the inflation problem we're still dealing with. But since then, a good chunk of the good side of the economy, including housing and many things housing related, some tech areas, some consumer areas, have gone into what could be defined as recession. You're now in disinflation, if not deflation, in those inflation, goods inflation categories. But we've then subsequently had the pent up demand on the services side. That's where the inflation is most sticky at this point. And I think because services employs more, 
than the good side of the economy. That helps to explain why the labor market has been relatively resilient. So that's the, the nature of a rolling recession. Um, and, you know, I know we've talked about this a little bit before, Lizanne, but we all know things are slowing. There's all this debate about whether we're in a recession, whether it's going to be this rolling recession that you describe or not. Why does it matter from a consumer and an investment perspective if it is technically a recession or does it matter? Is it just the sort of slowing that's the important part? I, I think if we were having this conversation a year ago and we were just off all time highs in equity indices, I would say it would matter a lot. But at the at the October lows, S&P was down 35 uh, percent, whether it's ultimately declared an actual recession by the NBER, which always comes, you know, well after the uh, the, the peak in economic activity. I, I'm not it, it's almost more academic at this point. That said, I think there's the feeders into the consumer confidence side of things as well as consumption. And that's more a function, I think, of if we start to see more headline deterioration in the labor market. Um, that's when I think the, the pinch will be felt a bit more. I'm not sure it has as many implications for the equity market from here, given the bear market that's been already underway for more than a year. Lizanne, how concerned are you about the what appears to be the spreading of these layoff announcements? It started in tech, but you got news today out of 3M saying they're laying, out 20, laying off 2,500 people in the manufacturing sector because of slowing demand. How concerned are you about that? I, I think it, it's going to get worse from here. Um, every leading indicator uh, suggests that the labor market will weaken. <laughs> in addition, you've got the Fed. Uh, essentially, they're not they're not gunning for a higher unemployment rate. They've got a, an unemployment rate about a percent higher than where it is right now in their dots plots and their economic uh, forecast. But what what Powell and pretty much every member of the Fed has been very clear about is they want to see a significant dent to labor market demand, sort of crush job openings without causing a significant increase in the unemployment rate. Now we are starting to see some pretty sizable layoffs. Interestingly, there are larger companies and they're more on the goods side of the economy where you're still seeing hiring on the services side of the economy. What it should have the effect of doing is continuing to bring down measures of wage growth that are done with averages, like average hourly earnings, because you're now increasingly taking larger wage jobs out of the mix. And the services areas that are hiring leisure and hospitality, as an example, tend to be on the lower end of the wage spectrum. So just the, that's the way the average works. You know, you take some of the larger numbers out, it's going to bring it down. That may be some false hope or maybe actual um, justified hope on the inflation side, but it's not necessarily a great sign for the economy more broadly. Within kind of the, the energy equation that we've been tracking last year in 2022, and then even further into 2023 as well, it still continues to be one of the preferred plays out there on the street. Um, Within the GOP House vote that's scheduled for this week uh, on an SPR bill, it's particularly being monitored because this is tied to perhaps the drawdown in 2022 efforts to refill this year as well. Is there any broader economic impact that you anticipate from that if it does go through? Um, I, I don't know if there's broader economic impact. It certainly is is a tricky situation when you're trying to replenish um, what you took out at prices that are not necessarily beneficial. And that, of course, is tied in part to uh, China's reopening after the lengthy period of lockdown. So I do think from a demand perspective and whether ultimately the, the price is right for replenishing those stockpiles, a lot has to do with the trajectory of, of China on the demand side for oil. Uh, Liz, and finally, as we look out here into 2023, is there one sort of message that you want to impart to investors more than any other to help them make money this year? Is there one theme that you really have high conviction on? So we have the return of the risk-free rate, courtesy of the aggressive Fed cycle, and that is reconnecting fundamentals to prices. It means there's price discovery again. Um, one of our big themes has been taking a factor-based approach and focusing on factors that represent what's dear or missing in the market. So strong free cash flow, strength of balance sheet, positive earnings revisions, pricing power. But it's also been an environment where active is having its best year relative to passive in an ex very extended period of time. And I think that 
in large part is to the benefit of investors, to the benefit of stock pickers. I just think for now, you don't want to fall into the trap of going way down the quality spectrum into some of the meme stocks, stay with those quality oriented factors, but apply that screening across the spectrum of sectors, as well as uh, cap ranges and even growth and value in, from an index perspective. Charles Schwab, Chief Investment Strategist, Lizanne Saunders. Always a treat to get some time with you. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much. All right, well, egg prices have skyrocketed over the past year, up nearly 60%. That's according to the latest inflation data. Now, this has one organization, Farm Action, calling on the FTC to investigate the egg industry. We want to bring in Joe Maxwell, Farm Action president, joining us now. Joe, it's great to have you here. We brought you on. There was a recent tweet that you just sent out saying egg prices were up 138%. You're calling BS on the excuses. Those excuses that you talk about are avian flu and inflation, you say it's price gouging. Why? Well, first, avian flu is real, but the consumers know that in this country, something's wrong at the grocery store with 138% increase in the price they're paying for eggs. It's obvious to us uh, when we look at the profit that these companies are making over 960% profit, uh, that something's wrong, something's a foul. Uh, pun intended, I, I assume, 58 million birds killed from the avian flu. How significant, in your estimation, has that contributed to the rise in prices? Well, it's obvious that the avian flu is real. Uh, 50 million laying hens uh, lost. Uh, but in 20, from 2021 to 2022, that reflected a loss of production of eggs in this country by 5%. 5% is a number, it's a real number, but it does not justify 138% increase at the grocery store, nor 960% increase in gross profits for the largest egg producer in this country who has not experienced one case of avian flu. Sometimes it's a blurry line between supply and demand and price gouging. How do you define that? When we focused on the FTC Act, the Federal Trade Commission Act, uh, there are several laws that govern this area. We felt that based upon uh, high prices of eggs, moderating cost of production of eggs, and no one in the marketplace coming in to take over market share from the dominant firms indicated something was going wrong. And we believe the FTC Act is the best place to talk about or have an investigation and review a tacit type of collusion. These companies working together to artificially keep the price high uh, using the avian flu and higher cost uh, as a basis for getting away with this price gouging. Well, Joe, in a statement, Calmine did say that there were many factors besides the avian flu that did impact prices, such as fuel, labor. They go on to say, quote, the domestic egg market has always been intensely competitive and highly volatile under even under normal market circumstances, end quote. They also went on to add that they do not sell eggs directly to consumers or set the retail egg prices. So what is your response to that? Absolutely. Well, According to their own filings in November, uh, using a 26 uh, week period prior to November 2022 and compared with November 26 week prior to November 2021, uh, the company did experience a 40% increase in cost of goods. 22% of that was reflected in feed costs. Feed costs went up 22% year over year. Uh, however, again, their gross profit was 960%. They turned the company from a net uh, income line item of a loss in 2021 to over $350 million profit. During the year, they're claiming avian flu and high cost was the basis for raising uh, these prices. The evidence, their own evidence, Cal Maine's own evidence found in the SEC filings would indicate something is not working right in the marketplace. And FTC, DOJ have authority to investigate and make that determination. And we're calling on them to do so on behalf of the consumers who are tired 
of facing these type of prices at the grocery store. It is a staggering number, sir, and, and consumers are really struggling with it. What has been the FTC's reaction? I know Senator Jack Reed is also calling on the FTC to investigate price gouging. How have they reacted to you? Well, in introducing this story, you indicated how busy uh, the FTC is. We will also be looking at sending a letter to DOJ or copying DOJ in on that letter along with USDA. Under the Biden administration's whole government <laughs> approach to antitrust and competition issues, uh, we feel that uh, we need to make sure every agency with this kind of power is alerted and the ones that have the bandwidth should immediately take on this issue on behalf of America's consumers. And what have been you, the focus here being on CalMain? Have we seen similar types of price increases across the industry? Absolutely. That's a key uh, point. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, CalMain chose to raise their prices by themselves. You would expect Rose Acres or one of the other leading dominant firms would step in, take that market share away. USDA clearly reported uh, in uh, August that with a moderating feed cost, and the high price of eggs, August of 2022, that the expectation of the market would be one firm would come in, put down more hens, have more eggs, and take market share away. In December of 2022, and this was our flag, in December of 2022, USDA ERS, that's the organization and government that makes these reports, indicated that had not happened. It had not materialized, was their words. So that begins to show that the market dynamics that one would expect in this scenario just aren't working which would indicate perhaps some type of tacit uh, uh, con um, collusion among the companies to keep egg prices high. I mean, why we're put down, why have more eggs if you're making more money selling fewer eggs? There's not an incentive, but yet the market dynamics say it should respond positively to add production and lower price. It's not working. So that's why we're calling on government to take a hard look, those agencies that have that responsibility. Okay, Farm Action President Joe Maxwell, please keep us posted, sir. Thank you. They've been described as the masters of the universe. Unless we see unemployment move up, I think it's hard to square that with a recession. Every year, a small village town in the Swiss mountains becomes overrun by CEOs, policymakers, central bank governors, and media outlets from every corner of the globe. After last year's summer outing, the good and the great are back in the cold, and the outlook seems frosty at best. I don't think that we are too deep into recession so far, right? It depends on the industry. But I am personally optimistic that there may not be a recession, or if there is one, it'll be short and shallow. Overall, I sense there's still more optimism here than what's sort of being portrayed relative to this fear of a recession. This year's World Economic Forum, perhaps unlike any other, the title, Cooperation in a fragmented world might be putting it lightly. The global economy is still battling the highest inflation in decades. So I think there will be parts of the world that go into recession this year, but we will choose to ignore that in the parts of the world that are enjoying continued growth. Trust in institutions ebbing. Well, you know the vibe here, because everyone is fairly on the bearish side. Everyone's talking about global recessions. A war raging on the very same continent. It's not a war. It's not a special operation. It's genocide and terrorism. Old friendships tarnished and new alignments taking shape. Add to that the risk the financial system is once again buckling under its own weight. FTX and SBF are not an exception. They are a rule. 99% of crypto is a scam. For one week, an opportunity to speak truth to power. That's Elon Musk, that's Jeff Bezos, that's Mark Zuckerberg. But the fact is that those people worth hundreds of billions of dollars also, at the same time, have literally no interest or conception in their role as stewards for civil society and American democracy. When we see people in the tech industry really struggling, um, the idea of throwing in a, a, you know, flying in a big performer, spending a ton of money on a lavish party didn't make a bunch of sense. And a chance to make sense of it all. We hear from the small group of individuals whose decisions impact all of us. 
Americans might start seeing some relief when it comes to prices that they're paying this year. Luckily, some key items are seeing deflation. Brooke De Palma is here with the details. Brooke, we are so anxious for this. Where are we starting to see some improvement? That's right. Some good news for consumers here. Smartphones among the top category that's seeing deflation. Of course, that's December 2022 as compared to December of 2021. But other categories, many that were popular during the pandemic, televisions, used cars and trucks, car rentals, video games or video equipment rather. Of course, we are all working from home then, in addition to computers and smartphones. But this really a supply and demand issue that we saw in 2021, with many of these categories coming back in 2022. So it's so many Americans at home, those rental car companies downsize their fleets. In addition to that, we saw that semiconductor chip shortage impacting new cars and more Americans going to use cars. In addition to that, bacon, lots of Americans excuse me, Americans flocking to bacon while at home. So that certainly surged in price. Of course, year over year, we saw that tick down. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out from Tyson and Kraft Heinz, Oscar Myers, um, in upcoming earning reserve results. But it's not all good news, some bad news. Although we're seeing beef tick down in the consumer price index, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go to Shake Shack and you're going to get a burger for cheaper next time. They already put higher costs or higher menu prices, rather, in 2022 and so those higher menu prices are expected to stay but the bacon's gone down so you just skip the eggs i wish i had a camera just, on you skip and the just eggs, have bacon. Skip the bread just have right. bacon just bacon <laughs> just a plate of bacon that's up my alley, my friend. Okay, what items really surprised you here? Well, that smartphone cost there. I feel like I spent so much money to get the new iPhone 14 Max there. But when Ooh, I you got the 14. I got the 14 Ooh, yeah. Max there. Oh, but uh, and I spent quite a, quite a lot of money on it. And I was so curious. So I went out to the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, economist, Jonathan Church, and he said that they actually do the consumer price index with a reflection of quality change in mind. So basically, you're getting more more bang for your buck for this new iPhone. So you're getting higher speed, you're getting more cameras, you're getting an increased screen size. And he said that it's typically a cycle effect. And while the business, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is not in the business of forecasting, they so quote, typically a new goods come in at a quote high price and they see a decline over time until they reach a quote unquote mature age, at which point they begin to, uh, or may begin to increase in price. So as Apple and Google and all these companies come out with more quality and you know bigger screen sizes and more cameras we're going to continue to see maybe a lower price year over year what model you got shauna <laughs> ten. what do you ten? have ten shauna yeah, i know the time. Google. what do you have <laughs> I 12. Okay, so I just got this, to be fair. Yeah. I just got well, I'm this. I'm jealous okay? of all the pictures, the quality of the pictures. <laughs> That's too. right. That's right. The quality is pretty good. I'll upgrade soon. Well, thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the weekend. You never can time the bottom of the market exquisitely well or the top. But you should basically say, look, the economy has some problems. People are pulling money out of the market. That's, that makes it cheaper and therefore it's time to get in. So I think it's actually a good time to invest. That was Carlisle Group co-founder David Rubenstein earlier this week at the World Economic Forum with some encouraging words for investors looking to get into the markets. But what can investors expect once they step foot into the volatile trading environment? We have PNC Asset Management Group Chief Investment Officer Amanda Agati here to discuss. Amanda, always a pleasure to speak with you and grab some of your time. You said that longer for longer appears to be the name of the game for the Fed's monetary policy strategy. Compare that with the comments you just heard from Rubenstein. You know, how is an investor to make their decision about when to jump in, and perhaps when to time their investment, given the Fed's policy and, and what you're eyeing up here? Well, thanks so much for having me. It's always great to be with you. It's a doozy of a question to start things off here. Uh, in general, we're not big fans of trying to time uh, market moves. And so a more systematic approach to allocating new capital into the markets feels right, especially given the perfect storm of macro headwinds that continues to swirl and really this high volatility regime that continues to dominate the backdrop. With the Fed firmly in the driver's seat here, we're going to continue to see some choppiness despite this kind of optimistic uh, short-term rally we've had to start the year. The Fed is nowhere near done 
the Fed definitely has much more to do. And that's why I keep saying it's sort of a longer for longer dynamic here. More rate hikes to come, obviously, potentially a higher terminal rate and a longer overall sustained tightening cycle. So with those being the big drivers in terms of the outlook, the backdrop financial conditions, I think it's going to be choppy waters for investors. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be actively invested in markets here. Well, Amanda, I'm just looking at your notes here. You've expressed some doubts about perhaps a soft landing that may not come, at least not uh, immediately and may never come in this cycle. But you're saying that we have potentially another 10 to 15 percent downside. So in that potential environment where we have uh, indices leading down, what are you looking for in maybe individual stocks, ETF style sectors, anything? What's grabbing your attention now? Well, I think for right now, we're still playing defense with the idea that we might have some more significant price declines ahead. You have to be playing a little bit of defense. So in general, we're positioned more towards favorability around U.S. over international, larger over smaller capitalization, um, and a bit more value oriented than growth, although that bet can kind of go a little bit either, either way. So not strongly tilting into value. But I think what's interesting in this environment is investors don't don't have to push too, too far out the risk curve like they have in prior years, given where interest rates are moving to. So on the fixed income side, we're not feeling quite as uh, you know a- a- ambitious in terms of moving into below investment grade credit. We still think there are opportunities in uh, investment grade here. Amanda, do you believe that this will be the quarter for earnings season where companies will finally start to be clear, transparent, perhaps rip the Band-Aid off about what the earnings expectations actually should be for the year and perhaps lead us to a less optimistic um, environment where we can kind of set real expectations for how they may perform and then the markets may pick up off of that? Oh, absolutely. We think the earnings recession clock starts to tick with Q4 earnings season. We did see some pretty significant negative revisions coming into Q4 earnings season, but nowhere near enough. Consensus is still too optimistic, given the potential for us to move into a recession as early as Q2. So when we just look at simple peak to trough kind of analyses over past economic cycles, even in a mild recessionary scenario, you'd expect earnings growth to fall about 10%. We're only about 3 4% off of the peak expectation. So there's definitely some more downside to go here. But I think at the end of the day, it really is all about the Fed. And so if the Fed kind of follows the course that they have signaled and the terminal rate kind of hangs in where it is with the current dot plot, you know, I think that mild recessionary scenario and sort of the 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 framing we've given around 10 to 15 percent downside makes sense. But if they do have to go further, a.k.a. higher, I think that's going to create a much choppier, much tougher uh, pressure for market returns this year, at least in the first half. When we get a better line of sight to where that end state for monetary policy is, I think the market will start to anticipate that and potentially rally. But I think it's going to be a tough first half. Yeah, got to agree with you about the Fed, all about the Fed watching very carefully here. Thank you, as always. Great to see you. Amanda Gotti, PNC Asset Management Group Chief Investment Officer. Vice Chair of the Federal Reserve, Lael Brainerd, spoke Thursday afternoon and said that while there are encouraging signs inflation is coming down, the central bank should stay the course of restrictive monetary policy. In a speech at the Chicago Booth School of Business this afternoon, Brainerd said, quote, even with the recent moderation, inflation remains high and policy will need to be sufficiently restrictive for some time to make sure inflation returns to 2% on a sustained basis. We are determined to stay the course. Brainerd says she's encouraged by a recent deceleration in wage growth and price trends in core goods and non-housing services, which she says signals we're not experiencing a 1970s-style wage price spiral. When asked what impact unwinding the Fed's balance sheet is having, Brainerd said estimates for the impact are probably about 50 to 75 basis points of tightening. Elsewhere Thursday, we heard from Boston Fed President Susan Collins, who said there are more rate hikes in store, though she anticipates at a slower pace. Pointing to still sticky high services inflation driven by wage growth, Collins said in a speech at the Boston Fed this morning, quote, there is more work to do. 
I anticipate the need for further rate increases, perhaps at a slower pace, depending on incoming data, before holding rates at a sufficiently restrictive level for some time. Collins says she thinks rates, which stand in a range of four and a quarter to four and a half percent, should come up to just above five percent before being held for some time at that level. As investors are not only worried about the threat of a default, they're also worried about a recession to how weak the economy could potentially get over the next couple of quarters. Yahoo Finance asked a number of business executives at the World Economic Forum in Davos about the possibility of a recession and what they're seeing within their business. Let's take a listen. Everyone's talking about recessions, but of course, when I talk to people and ask them about their business, they seem to think their business is okay. So everyone here seems to think the other person has a problem. Mild recession, slightly down for a couple of quarters and then back to uh, slightly up and then more normal in 24 and into 25. I don't think that we are too deep into recession so far. I think there will be parts of the world that go into recession this year, um, but we will choose to ignore that in the parts of the world that are enjoying continued growth. So pretty optimistic was my first takeaway from this. When we talk about the threat of a looming recession, I feel like we've been sounded like a broken record over the last couple of months talking about one. When you compare those comments to some of the surveys and the reports, though, that we've gotten out of Davos, they're very optimistic. There was one from the forum, which is of chief economists, saying that two-thirds of chief economists expect a worldwide recession this year. PwC was out with the survey. It was the most pessimistic it has ever been. Okay, we've been, th these same people have been saying roughly the same thing for about nine months. Mm -hmm. um, so since we got inflation hitting 9% last June, uh, you have heard economists, multiple economists, many business people saying, uh, we think that this can only lead to a recession uh, within six to nine months, and it keeps not happening. So we are trying to talk ourselves into a recession. Uh, it could happen, but I mean, look at just look at the job market. I mean, something is very different about the economy that's uh, from compared with different cycles. Uh, we've got a super low unemployment rate, unbelievable job growth, um, and, and some other signs that point to a slowdown. But it, it keeps not happening. I don't know what to say about it. I well, mean, again, I think part of it depends upon your definition because the technical definition yep. of a recession we already hit so let's erase that then and look at the current circumstances to your point three and a half percent historically low on un unemployment job creation every month keeps ticking we're seeing the consumer continue to spend the only place you could really point to is the earnings beginning to decline mm -hmm. but yeah to your point rick maybe we're talking ourselves into a recession rather than noticing and observing the resilience of the consumer and the hot employment market, you've heard employers say, we're going to continue to hang on to our employees. We don't want to lose them. Yeah. If I could just add one final thought here, we could go through a recession and not really notice at this point. I mean, it's possible that we have a recession that is so mild that it doesn't seem like a recession to most people. We've got people's financial situation is in good shape. Uh, people are not taking out horrible loans they can't repay anymore. Uh, we're not going to see a bubble in the housing market like we did in 2008, 2009. So it's possible we get this little speed bump in the economy and we just motor right through it. And by the way, that would actually help quite a lot with inflation, bringing inflation down. All right, welcome back to the World Economic Forum uh, here in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, we spent the whole week talking to a lot of executives, and one of them was a friend of the show, HP CEO Enrique Lores. Uh, he's coming off a very tough decision uh, of having to lay off 12% of his workforce. I asked him more about that and the state of his business. I think he's probably po more positive than what we saw last May. Actually, I was telling the team when we came in May, the U.S. delegation was more optimistic than the European delegation. This time, it's probably the opposite which tells about the different challenges that the different companies are seeing and the different geographies. Do you think we're just making too much about a potential recession this year? Uh, there are a bunch of surveys that have come out. PwC said uh, most CEOs, 73 percent of them polled, were looking for a recession this year. I think it's hard to know what is going to happen, and clearly I'm not an expert. Mm -hmm. What is true, though, is there are significant challenges when we look at the impact of inflation, the impact of the war, 
the increase of energy prices, the situation in China, each of these things could drive for our recession. Hard to know what will happen. For all of us, what is important is to focus on those things that we can control. I think this is where we as CEOs can add value. And in our case, it's really about managing our cost while we continue to invest in the growth areas to position ourselves in the right way for whenever the economy will, will revamp. There are a lot of moving pieces to this year, absolutely. As you frame out the year, what is the biggest challenge you're up against? I think it's being able to do both because, as I said, we need to reduce our cost structure to be more competitive, but also we need to continue to invest in hybrid work, we need to continue to invest in gaming, in consumer services, and balancing that is, is the challenge we have, but we are optimistic that we will be able to do both and position the company for, for the future. Uh, speaking of cost reduction, you've made a big move. You made a big move you to reduce 12% of your workforce. How hard is it? to make a decision like that at, at this point in time? It, it is always very hard because anything that has people implications are probably the hardest decisions we have to make as, as executives. But at the same time, they are the right thing to do for the success of the company. And what we need to do is manage them in the right way for the employees while we execute them to, for the future of the company. Those cost savings, how do you reinvest them in the business? We, we have identified five key growth areas and what we have said is some of the savings will go to the bottom line. Some will also be used to continue to accelerate the growth in those areas. Because this is where we see the future of the company. They represent now more than 11 billion dollars and we expect them to continue to grow in 2023. Do you think the cost cutting is done? You've, you've gotten everything out of the way that you need to get out of the way. In a company like us, there are always opportunities to continue to reduce cost. When you have $60 billion of revenue, $50 plus billion of cost, there are always opportunities to reduce cost, which is one of the strengths that we have, we know how to identify that and execute on that. You've really started to pivot the company to a hybrid work environment to support that environment. Take us through some of those initiatives. I think we, first, first of all, we believe that the future of work is hybrid. We see the benefits for the company, we see the benefits for employees, and we see a lot of opportunities for innovation to make uh, the right employee experience. If you think, for example, about the experience that the employees that are connecting to a virtual meeting are having when some of them are working from home, some are working from the office, Clearly a lot of work to do to make sure that they feel integrated, they feel part of the meeting, they can see body language, they can be heard. That's an area where we are investing because we really see an opportunity to well, grow and differentiate. I can tell you're having fun right now. I'm just studying your body language. It looks like you're having fun. We're actually, we're, we're still really cold, guys. I'm not making this up. It's freezing out here right now. Uh, look, as we look into the you know back half of the year, I talked to one uh, well-known tech CEO. I, I can't say because it, it was off the record, but they said the PC correction may not end until next year, what do you see? What, what we have said is that we expect the inventories to be fixed by the first half of 23. And this is a big part of what is driving the correction. And the rest is going to be really driven by what happens with demand, what happens with economy, what happens with the recovery. Hard to predict at this point. What we are doing is working with multiple scenarios, as we said in our last earning calls, and make sure that we identify the actions that we need to take, depending on what scenario we, we see happening. I was thinking back the other night, and when the pandemic first hit, I went to a Best Buy store, and I bought a lot of junk. Things that I just needed right away, $30 webcam, you name it, not good stuff. And now it's all broken, it doesn't work. Do you see a major re, I don't know, refreshing of all of these products over the next few years? Because they don't work, and to your point, we may still be working from home in some components. I, I do, and both the num increase of number of PCs that were sold, but also cameras, uh, displays, all of them represent an opportunity to be replaced all of them will be replaced. We really think that people are gonna to continue to work in a hybrid way, which means sometimes working from home, sometimes working from the office, doing different things in the different locations. And clearly this is a big opportunity for us. I'm talking to a lot of leaders and they all seem to be using Davos also not only meet with clients and drum up business, but rethinking how they lead as a leader. Have you had any just moments alone to yourself here thinking about how you may lead differently coming out the other side of this pandemic? 
for, for me, one of the big benefits of Davos is really listening mm. and listening what others are doing, what others are thinking, what others are feeling, and use that to really redesign the plans for the company, but also for some uh, personal experience. So definitely, yes, and I think this is one of the big values of the four days that we spent here in the cold. Good uh, life advice there from HPC Enrique Lores. Uh, talk less and listen more. Our Let's talk about all this, what it means for the what it means for the Fed, what it means for the market going forward. We want to bring in Jordan Jackson, JP Morgan Asset Management Global Market Strategist. Jordan, it's great to see you. So looking at losses today, the Dow off nearly 500 points. We got some weak econ data, retail sales coming in lower than expected, some hawkish comments from Fed officials today. How are you looking at the drop at today and what this means for the markets going forward? Sure. You know, I think the markets are trying to trying to figure out just how weak growth is going to be or how much growth is going to slow down uh, in the economy over the course uh, of this year. And so uh, obviously we're seeing uh, some cracks amongst the consumer, uh, given the retail sales number. Now, I know this is a, uh, not adjusted for inflation. So we did see a nine and a half percent drop uh, in energy prices last month core goods prices coming down. So I think that all sort of filters into some of the retail sales numbers. Uh, we also have to recognize that it is very goods orientated, the retail sales figures. And so we, we continue to see signs that um, uh, consumers continue to shift towards uh, 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 paying for services versus buying goods. Uh, but on balance, as we look at some of the manufacturing data, some of the ISM numbers, all continue to signal that the economy is certainly slowing. Now, the question is going to be, are we headed for a soft landing or are we headed for, for a hard landing? Uh, and so I think, again, markets are, are trying, trying to figure uh, just, just what kind of landing uh, the economy may be headed for, for. On that regard, Jordan, what's your expectation? Can we avoid a recession? Well, I think we can. You know, the reality is the labor market continues to, to, to some extent, be firing on all cylinders. Uh, I will say, though, it does seem like we're seeing a bit of a divergence uh, among small and medium-sized businesses and some of the lar their larger uh, uh, counterparts. You know, I travel across the country and, and speaking with business owners, uh, they can't hire workers fast enough. Um, they're really struggling to find a qualified labor, and that could very well keep uh, the wage inflation number, wage growth number, somewhat elevated. I mean, we still expect a bit of cooling in wage inflation, uh, but still a little bit high. Uh, and, and, and certainly we're seeing uh, layoffs amongst the larger companies that probably did a little bit of overhiring. Uh, coming out of the pandemic. And so you know, I think we're in an environment in which if, if inflation continues to come down, wage growth continues to remain fairly firm, uh, we could actually see real wage growth turn positive by the middle of this year, providing a bit of support uh, for consumption growth uh, over the course of 2023. Yeah, you mentioned the, the layoffs, in particular, really isolated on the tech sector for the most part, besides Goldman Sachs, 3,000 plus. When or if do you think they spread well beyond the big tech. Well, I, I always try to remind our investors, right? Uh, technology as a sector really only counts for about 2% of the overall labor force. Yeah. So I, I do recognize that these are large companies that are, are taking up a lot of headlines, uh, but we just aren't seeing uh, that, 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 that sort of widening out or of, 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 of labor market weakness. Um, and so again, if we look at small and medium sized business, they're, they're still clamoring for, for workers, qualified workers. Uh, there's still an excess demand for labor out there, some 10 million job openings to 6 million unemployed. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. We're just not seeing signs. Initial unemployment claims also probably continue to run at very, very low levels. And so we're just not seeing any clear signs that this labor market weakness is broadening it out outside of uh, the tech sector. Jordan, investors are putting a lot of emphasis, placing a lot of focus on the earnings results that we have gotten and what we're going to get over the coming weeks. We've only gotten just over 30 of the S&P 500 companies have reported so far, but there's a lot of doom and gloom projections heading into this quarterly results. What do you make of the reports that we have gotten so far? Sure. So uh, on a year over year basis in the fourth quarter, uh, we're now tracking a roughly 7 percent decline uh, in earnings per share growth. However, quarter over quarter, so from 3Q over 4Q, are expecting modestly positive results. And I think the year over year numbers are uh, more so reflective of a lot of the pressures that we've continued to talk about uh, over the course of 2022, a higher input costs, higher wage pressures, um, uh, but but we're seeing signs, at least on the, at least over the fourth quarter, that some of those pressures may have eased uh, a little bit. And, and uh, as it was talked about a little bit early, it's, it's really a sector by sector case. 
right? We're still expecting to see energy, uh, healthcare, uh, industrials, particularly airlines and transport deliver positive earnings growth, uh, whereas te the tech sector, communication services, discretionary, look to be coming under a bit of a bit of pressure. And so, you know, in portfolios, we're still leaning a little bit more defensive. While the defensive sectors are certainly taking it on the chin today, uh, they, they they tend to be a bit more stable as we think about a, a volatile earnings seasons relative to some of the more cyclically orientated sectors, again, like, uh, like, like technology and energy, for an example. Great stuff there. Jordan Jackson, appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Dr. Doom is how he's known, although at our All Market Summit last fall, he told us he prefers Dr. Realist. I'm talking, of course, of NYU professor and economist Noriel Rabini. We talked to him today about some of the themes being discussed here at Davos, what has been dubbed the poly crisis going on right now, all of the things in the world going wrong, climate crisis, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, etc. His book is called Mega Threats, which is basically a different word for the same thing. Listen now to our conversation with Noriel Rabini. I've been speaking about uh, mega threats, not just economic, monetary, financial, but also political, geopolitical, environmental, health, technological, deglobalization. And now this buzzword of uh, polycrisis, the same idea as mega threat, is one that everybody's using. You know, I was on the stage with the head of the IMF last month in Washington, and she spoke about a confluence of calamities, saying that the world economy has never say, faced so much threat since World War II. Larry Summers made the same kind of arguments, and the WEF just published their world global crisis report, in which is again is talking about severe threats and about poly crisis, and there are all these interconnected threats that are both on the economic side, political geopolitical, social, environmental, health, technological, and so on. So I think it's becoming something of a common wisdom. And the topic of the WEF this year is cooperation in a fragmented world. The emphasis on the fragmented because there is not much cooperation in a world in which there are geopolitical depression and great powers are rival with each other on most things. So it's a world of mega threats or poly crisis. And, and doesn't matter how you call it. <laughs> it's all disturbing. Is this the same idea? Uh, you know, large part because of that fragmentation, Noriel, there's a lot of uh, CEOs here predicting a mild recession. Do you think they will be surprised by the severity of any recession we do get if we do get one? Yes, the consensus is about the short and shallow recession, a couple of quarter negative growth, and then you have a collapse of price of wage inflation. The Fed, ECB, and others stop hiking by mid-year, then they cut rates by the second half, and then markets and economy grow again. I'm skeptical for many reasons. Reason number one is that there will be a spike in commodity prices this year, not just energy, but also all across the board, other ones. Goldman Sachs actually predicts a 42% increase in commodity prices this year. And the reason is there has been a massive underinvestment in new capacity, not only in oil and natural gas, but across the board. Demand is growing gradually, with China coming back to growth. There will be more demand, supply is constrained, you'll have a spike. Second reason is that labor markets all over advanced economies are very tight. Unemployment rate is very low. Labor force participation rate has fallen, aging of populations, restriction to migrations, uh, the great resignation, labor strife, fiscal policy are pro-labor. So you don't need more than 5-6% wage growth like in the U.S. with productivity 1% to have unit labor costs going up 5%, and therefore inflation getting stuck around 5 It's easy to go from 10 to 5 It's much harder to go from 5 to 2 and in the service sector is dominating the economy is mostly labor costs rather than raw material and so on. So my view, markets and Fed, ECB will be surprised on the upside on how much while inflation has fallen now is going to remain sticky around 5-6%. And then they'll have a very tough dilemma. Either they raise rates more, say towards 6% for the Fed, about 4 for the ECB, and they cause a real hard landing. And on the top of the hard landing, there is also a financial crash, mm -hmm. stock market, credit spreads, bond yields, and so on. So you have economic financial crash, so a real hard landing. They feed on each other. As you have more distress, you'll have more of a recession, and more recession means more distress on the debt side. Or, as I believe, they're going to wimp out, they're going to blink, mm -hmm. they're not going to raise enough. But then you have a de-anchoring of inflation, inflation expectation. You get a wage price spiral, and then you end up again with stagflation. You postpone that crisis by a couple of years. So them if you do, and them if you don't. I think the optimism is really misplaced. What well, do you think the the Fed would be to blame here? They're unwinding this massive liquidity here, raising rates. They have raised rates aggressively. The U.S. housing market is slowing down. 
aren't they the ones to blame for a potential massive recession in the U.S.? Well, inflation got out of the control in part because there was loose monetary credit a fiscal policy. So the Fed has to be blamed like other central banks for not seeing the rise of inflation. Secondly, there were also negative supply shocks that reduced growth and increased inflation, like the impact of COVID on production, on global supply chains, on labor supply, the impact of Russia, Ukraine on global commodity prices, and of course, until recently, the zero COVID policy of China. So it's a combination of bad policy and bad luck. Now they have to make up for it, but the problem is that if the raising rates enough, they cause an economic and financial crash. And in my view, we are in a debt trap. There is so much private and public debt in the world rising from 100% of GDP to 420 in advanced economies since the 70s that you cause not only an economic crash, but also a financial crash that feed on each other. Therefore, the left wimp out and therefore we're going to live in a world of much higher inflation, around 5.6 as opposed to 2. That's where we're going. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that potential financial crash. We talked to you back in the fall at our All Market Summit, and you talked about some of the same themes. Yeah. Now here we are in the new year, and most of the strategists, at least in the United States, are looking for a little bit of a gain in markets this year. It doesn't, from what you're describing, that doesn't sound like that's a scenario that you would be predicting. How bad is it going to be this year in, in equity markets? Well, if you believe in the softish landing scenario of a short and shallow recession with a couple of quarters of negative growth, say Q1 and Q2, then the market is a bit wobbly, but by the time that there is a slack in goods and labor market because of that recession, you have a drop in price and wage inflation, then the Fed doesn't go all the way to 525, stays around 475, and then they cut rates already in the second half of the year. And then you have happy endings for growth and for the markets in the second half of the year. That's assuming that actually the markets are right. First of all, the Fed is telling the markets, no way, even if we're optimistic, inflation is going to be slightly higher than you expect. We're not going to have a real recession. We'll have a soft landing. Therefore, we have to go all the way to 525, stay on hold until the end of the year, and then cut rates next year. So there's already a massive disconnect between markets and the Fed. And the markets being ahead of the curve makes the problem of the Fed worse because the easing of financial condition with stock market going higher, bond yields falling, the dollar weakening, credit spread narrowing implies more growth and it makes harder for the Fed to achieve their inflation. And they have to tighten actually more, be, be given this tug of war between markets and the Fed. What I'm saying is that both the Fed and the market will be surprised on how sticky inflation is going to be once it gets around 5, 6-ish. And then either they do much more, causing economic and financial crash, and in which case the equity market is going to be really sharply down because in a severe hard landing from current level, equity prices will have to fall another 20% or the wind pout. If the wind pout, then the market is going to rally. There'll be a power put for a little while. But then once you have a hinge of inflation expectation, longer it's rise. And then you still get down the line a crash of the stock market. You just postpone it by six months. Market conversation here is elevated volatility. It remains a sticking point for investors in this new regime. Here to discuss, we've got Candace Say, who is Goldman Sachs Asset Management Global Head of Strategic Advisory Solutions. Great to have you here with us this morning, Candace. Uh, first and foremost, as we're hearing conversations coming out of World Economic Forum and, and Davos around and acknowledging what a mild or a shallow recession might look like, but then also in the same breath saying, hey, we're out here to make deals and govern our business to really weather through that. How can investors glean insight from that in order to position their portfolio best? Absolutely. Last year, 2022, a lot of investors faced alarming headlines across the board, whether it was high inflation prints, central banks raising rates, and then also you had all the geopolitical activity that was happening across the world. So all of this contributed to that extraordinary year of volatility. So as an investor, uh, just to put into perspective what we've been through, essentially we had 219 trading days where the S&P 500 moved over 100 basis points intraday over the course of the last year. That means 80 5% of the trading days that we experienced last year uh, were highly volatile uh, between beginning to end of the market. And with that said, we think that moving forward over the course of the next decade, as we move into this next cycle, we think there's going to be more levels of volatility uh, in our future. So uh, the things to consider given this type of environment, we think that investors should really start thinking about left tail risk, but also really focusing in on asset classes that they traditionally haven't thought about within their portfolio construction and also 
also active management. Those would be three ways that we think investors should start thinking about their portfolios moving into a period of more elevated volatility to come. Well, let me ask you, can you enumerate some of those um, alternative assets that you were talking about that are available to retail investors? Because a lot of those are only available to institutional invest investors. Absolutely. There are a couple of different avenues for uh, normal investors who have the ability to invest. For example, multi-strategy hedge funds is one way that they can access a diversified portfolio of hedge fund investments. Uh, typically, if you're able to diversify your portfolio uh, with multi-asset class uh, hedge funds, you can actually increase your potential for return, especially as you compare it versus the S&P 500, especially in times of volatility. The other area within alternatives I would talk about is private assets. So if you're looking to maintain a long-term strategic allocation and portfolio construction, this is a way that can enable you to stay focused on investing in the long-term because you do have capital locked up for anywhere from 10 to 15 years. So again, that really depends on the wherewithal for clients, depending on where they are in terms of their investment acumen and sophistication. But there are ways to access multi-strategy hedge funds, but also private um, credit, private equity, if they have the ability to. What would you be looking for kind of a concerted turn in, in the markets here. And of course, we had seen the, the rally of the past couple of days here, but then you think about going further out into 2023 and, and getting past this first quarter and the ripping off of the Band-Aid as we continue to talk about that many businesses are doing right now just to set expectations. When is that concerted, that, that turn from, from your calculus and your estimation? Absolutely. We all know that the equity markets in particular is a forward uh, looking mechanism and machine, and it tends to move before economic data is in place. So with that said, uh, with many firms calling for a recession, our firm being one uh, that is on the lower side of the probability, we still believe that there is an opportunity for a potential soft landing, uh, the potential to avoid a recession. Uh, but nonetheless, it's going to be a, a tough year. Given our base case of no recession, if that is the correct call, we do believe that markets probably stay around the level it is today, around the levels of 4,000. But as you know, forecasting is more of an art than a science. Uh, so in thinking about what that means to have a 4,000 level on the S&P 500, that would mean earnings of about 0%, so earnings growth, and the earnings level of 224, which is exactly what we ended last year, 2022 at. That's our base case. All right, we got to leave it there, but really appreciate, appreciate your in insights here. As always, Candace Say, Goldman Sachs Asset Management, Global Head of Strategic Advisory Solutions. Talking about recessions, but of course, when I talk to people and ask them about their business, they seem to think their business is okay. So everyone here seems to think the other person has a problem. Mild recession, slightly down for a couple quarters and then back to uh, slightly up and then more normal in 24 and into 25. I don't think that we are too deep into recession so far. I think there will be parts of the world that go into recession this year, um, but we will choose to ignore that in the parts of the world that are enjoying continued growth. Recession is a world heard around the Alps and Davos, and those were just some of the voices we've heard from so far, warning that a recession could be coming this year. Now let's, begin, let's get back on the ground in Davos, Switzerland, where Julie Hyman and Brian Sazi are standing by. You guys look great, if not a little, a little frigid, <laughs> but uh, how, how are things there? Well, not bad, Jared. Uh, no, we're not frigid. So it's a little cool out here, but uh, all things uh, are going well. Maybe uh, actually a lot better than what we're hearing from executives here in terms of how their businesses are going and the economy. A lot of executives, like we just talked to, you saw on the tape right there, focused on recession, planning for recession in some cases. We just talked to KPMG, uh, US CEO, uh, looking at a lot of companies potentially looking to restructure their business. Yeah, and, and sort of preparing for a slowdown is what we're hearing. But it's not that negative, really, the rhetoric that we're hearing, despite what you just heard. Yes, people are talking about a slowdown. They're talking about a potential recession. But we also heard, you know, less pessimistic comments from IMF head uh, Gita Gopinath, right, where she was talking about the economists there are talking about that we are going to have a slowdown, but it maybe won't be as bad as first feared. And the other thing that struck me that I thought was really interesting, Brian, we talked to Chuck Robbins of Cisco. And he said, you know, all you guys in the media want to ask us about recession and, and you know, yes. people, people externally want to talk about recession. But the meetings he's having with other executives, the meetings he's having with global leaders, they're not necessarily talking about recession. They're talking about specific business initiatives, specific partnerships, specific philanthropic work that they are working on. So 
it's interesting that sort of um, divide, if you will, between the discussions we're having mm -hmm. and we want to know about and what they're discussing amongst themselves. And, right, Julian, that's one bubble here. And the other bubble is just this overall event. You know, you're hearing news and, and you have investors on the Yahoo Finance platform right now seeing or waking to news of Microsoft laying off 10,000 people. I look down the promenade, I see Salesforce recently laid, oh, laid off, what, almost 10,000 people of its, oh, that's Amazon, excuse me, 10,000 people. They have an installation here, 20,000 layoffs alone from the two big tech companies on this promenade here at the World Economic Forum. And on Thursday, Microsoft is slated and reportedly to have their cocktail party, guest singer Sting. Now, I would mm -hmm. like to see more humility here from these big cocktail companies, because in many respects, they are acting the same way they did at every other single World Economic Forum. I've been here, and unlikely the ones that I wasn't able to get to because I wasn't in this field. <laughs> I, would, eh. I know. We'll, we'll debate more on that later. Okay, well, I mean, continuing the conversation though, you, you also heard some criticism on tech from friend of the show, Ian Bremmer, while you were out there. What did you have to say? Well, Ian Bremmer of Eurasia just talked about the dominance of tech titans and their disinterest in being really stewards of democracy um, and playing that role. This is what he said. That's Elon Musk, that's Jeff Bezos, that's Mark Zuckerberg, it's all these people. But the fact is that those people worth hundreds of billions of dollars also at the same time have literally no interest or conception in their role as stewards for civil society and American democracy. That is the different sides of the absolute same coin. And all of America's lionizing free markets and capitalism has also led to a vastly more dysfunctional democratic process because these companies are inadvertently, but nonetheless, aligning with business models that destroy democracy. You know, and he was talking about, in particular, social media. He brought up the idea that China does not allow many of these social media platforms there because they see their destructive power. So that was an interesting theme that he was talking about as well. Not as much of the zeitgeist here, but still an interesting point that he made. And we're going to hear much more of, of Bremer's comments later in the show. Yeah, and Ian was very much right on the mark. Where And, and by and large, big, ta big cap tech has been unchecked by various administrations and the government for some time now. And guess what, newsflash to these folks uh, in government, the next wave of AI and in AI intelligence is coming. And we've talked to a lot, talked to a lot of executives here that this could be a, a job killer. We've got to sample some apps here and what they could and, and may or may not do. And they're absolutely mind blowing. One of my thoughts among many is, well, wow, that's gonna be, we're gonna need probably less, five less fewer workers at XYZ company. I, I wanna circle back to something you were talking about before just real quick, which, you know, all these layoffs that we're talking about and the disconnect between that and the obvious spending that's happening here. Optically, yes, but from a real perspective, if you look at how much they might be spending here on the promenade and really realistically, how many jobs that's equal to. We're not talking about a lot, but it's an optics issue rather than a real, like, how are they allocating the spending issue? We also know they're not cutting jobs across the board. They're cutting them in areas that where they overhired or that they don't think are going to grow as much. Optic, you're, you're right on the mark, Julie. Optically, it's not a good look because if you're a Microsoft employee today that is getting a pink slip, you're probably going onto LinkedIn and posting and letting your network know about that you are no longer employed by Microsoft. Then you might also see news that, oh yeah, uh, Sting is playing at a Microsoft cocktail party at one of the most exclusive events uh, for CEOs and, and billionaires in the world. I, I think it's an extremely big de disconnect and I'm very fired up about it, clearly. Clearly. It's hard to imagine that anybody would throw a tomato at Sting while he's performing, but I would point you in the direction of Ian Bremmer if you do see a tomato thrown. Thank you so much for <laughs> checking in with us here, Julie and Brian. So, our team, uh, Candace Browning Platt and our research team, have moved their recession look out a little later in this year into early next year. That means that they actually have a positive number for GDP growth in the U.S. this year, slightly positive. And it'll be a mild recession, largely because the stimulus and other things, even though the Fed's raised rates, you see the, uh, the capacity of the American consumer to keep going. Um, and so they're basically mild recession early next year. But over the last year, that's been constantly pushed out, and so we'll see what happens. But mild recession, slightly down for a couple quarters and then back to uh, slightly up and then more normal in 24 and into 25. How much pressure is the U.S. consumer under right now? Well, it's it's an interesting thing because it's a sort of a tale of two cities. In the one hand, uh, our customers spend four trillion dollars a year. That spending dollar volume grew in the fourth quarter of 22 by about five percent. In the 
first quarter 22 over 20, first quarter 21, it grew 14 percent. So you can see the impact of them slowing down. Now it's up dramatically from 19, like 25, 30 percent in the aggregate, even more. So if you think about that, they're spending, they're spending well. The first part of this. Uh, January, the first 10 days or so, they're up about 6 or 7%. So a little bit fell over because of delays in travel. So they're spending nicely. The money in their accounts continues to be solid. It's coming down slightly. They're spending down some of the excess stimulus and excess savings. Uh, but they're all employed. I and mean, the thing people forget is the United States employment picture is still pretty strong. And the Fed is, needs that to get a little worse to have that services side inflation come back in line. Within the context of this model recession call by your team, what happens to unemployment? Where do you see that unemployment rate go? So the, there are three or four core components. Unemployment gets to 5%, a little bit 5% plus as we move into the part, latter part of this year into next year um, and sort of stays there and comes down uh, you know, beginning the end of 24. Without unemployment, I, it, I always ask our economists, how can you have an unemployment-less recession? How can you actually have a two-thirds of the American economy driven by consumers if they're working and getting paid and wages continue to rise? How can we have a recession? And they can give me a lot of explanations, but the reality is you know, the manufacturing side is slowing down. Some of the consumer activity slowing down, but unless we see unemployment move up, I think it's hard to square that with the recession, and that's what's going on. So our unemployment is to move up to 5%, or else they really wouldn't be able to predict the recession. Would this be a, a mild recession within lower income consumers? I look at a lot of things that consumers are feeling right now on the lower end. Inflation, it's come down, it's slowed, but it's still very high. Average, those higher end consumers it appear to still be out there spending aggressively. Look, the, the, the problem with inflation, why you got to cut it off, it hits the people who can least afford it because food prices mean the same, people don't eat a lot more. So what happens is think about the percentage spent on that gas prices, same thing. So that's the thing that people have to be careful about. And when people say, well, if they fight inflation, rates go up, you know, somebody can't buy a new car that's an affluent, that's, that's not really what they're after. They have to make sure the inflation comes down. So the core wage growth of the American median income household will exceed the expense growth and therefore they can cash flow positive. And if you look across multiple years, they're still okay, but in the more recent times, real wage growth has fallen back and that's caused some of that slowdown by the consumer. And speaking of slowdown, the Fed and their very, and their interest rate hikes have also really impacted the housing market uh, in this country, really slowed down that market. How long do you see this downturn playing out? Well, you know, and the reality is, you know, you're going along after the financial crisis at, in the recovery, a sort of a normal long-term growth rate. Then you spiked up in the pandemic because there was a demand created, uh, low interest rates, plus people wanting to doing different kinds of housing thought processes, and that's coming down. And so. The Fed raises rates to get to the things that are rate sensitive, housing, cars, uh, uh, corporate debt borrowing. That's what they need to do to slow down the economy. That is their job, to get inflation under control. And so we'll see it tip down. But frankly, it's, it's, it's not the issue because it's not over lent and over borrowed as it was in the, before the financial crisis. Just the structure, our, our LTV and our mortgage portfolio, which is $200 billion, is in the mid 50s or something like that. So even refresh. So it's not, the banking system's in good shape. And so it's just different this time than that time. On the other hand, you know, they have to slow down the housing appreciation because that wealth effect lends people to start borrowing that money and doing things, and they've done that. I, I will, I'll call you this. You're the, I would say, the wartime CEO of 2010 at Bank of America. Those times were, I mean, they were absolutely terrifying. The home market slowed, stock market slowed. Is what the Fed is now doing with rates, unwinding that liquidity, are they sowing the seeds for something like that again? You know, they, I don't think so because... Uh, the transparency of the Fed going back to Jackson Hole and, and, and Chairman Bernanke saying we're going to tell you what we're going to do and adopt plots and all this stuff, yeah, they're signaling the market. Sometimes the market takes them on saying, you know, you're not going to raise rates as much as we have rates going up, you know, five, five and a quarter. The market sort of say maybe not, you know, yeah, those types of things. But I think the transparency, I think the care, I think the amount of data, honestly, people forget how much data is there. I, you know, and they're getting it real time and so they have a, a better sense. But it's tough to get the services side inflation down and that's what they're focused on. So if people are looking for indicators, they're looking for a new claims for unemployment still very low, as low as they were in history almost now. And uh, uh, job creation is still slowing down, but still pretty strong. So I think those are the indicators looking at, but the real time nature of this, I think, allows them to see a little bit further uh, the impact of their activities. And then we're all feeding them data um, about the market's activity and stuff that wasn't transparent before, where the, you know, where the P's are under the mattress, so to speak, in terms of risk. You know, when something goes down instantaneously, we could all tell them what the exposure is to you know, one of these named things that has a problem. So I, I think it's just different. Now, is it perfect? We'll find out, but I think they do a pretty good job. We do a pretty good job managing these companies. My peers and colleagues around the world you know, take it very seriously to maintain the stability and the, and the capability of the bank institutions, and the regulators and central banks have taken the same approach. Equity markets have stabilized a bit uh, to kick off this year, and in large part because of this expectation, I think, of we get rate cuts at some point this year. 
Do you think that happens at some point in the back half of the year? Our, our equity market uh, strategist, uh, Savita Sebramanium, has basically the equity market flat for the year. Now, within that, she's saying there's great opportunities in different sectors. But in, in, in part, you know, she said that last week, and then she sort of was confronted with the market actually moved up to match her year-end thing. So she sort of said, you have to think about this. And so that's not an exact 4,000 number, but it's a number that gives you an indication that the feeling is, as a recessionary environment's there, as corporate debt gets more expensive, as the labor market softens, you know, the idea of earnings growth in, in, for companies, you know, that's one of the challenges. And so I think that's all going to wash through the system. But it, does the Fed need to lower rates this year? We're still thinking and I think people have to listen to them, they may leave this higher for longer just to make sure they squeeze out that services side inflation. And it just as a slower burn on that. Uh, the theme here at the World Economic Forum is a, a frag cooperation in a fragmented world. Now, you <clears throat> met with uh, the administration, you were in that room with a lot of your fellow CEOs. Uh, how fragmented is the world from a business perspective? Well, I think there's the challenges in with the administration yesterday you know bipartisan here to engage with the business community by the way leaders around the world here to engage with the business community that's the unique thing what davos has is you know you can walk down the street and and see you know people from administrations around the world. You can see business people around the world. You can see uh, advocates of all different types around the world. So that's the value. And I, so I think the issue is you know, trade. And the issue is the free trade and, and the globalization, the supply chain globalization, things that provide a great benefit to the world's citizens, you, you know, called into question. But it's a little bit more about resiliency supply chain than, than people think. And so people have learned a lesson about s single source supply at the lowest possible cost. Maybe it needs to be multiple source. That's going on in the business community. But what they want to know is what are the set of rules that they can actually develop those multiple sets and, and drive it. And yet we've got to make this tr just transition for energy. We've got to do a lot of things in the world to solve a lot of problems. And the best way to do it is with the cooperative agencies. And so whether it's the WTO, whether it's the IMF, whether it's the World Bank, whether these multilateral and in governance themselves, G7, G20, the, the idea of coming together and saying we've got to solve these problems. We can have differences. We can be strategic competitors, but we have to have things that we're trying to solve, and, and that's what you hope comes out of sessions like this. Welcome back to our Yahoo Finance live coverage in Davos of the World Economic Forum. And one of the debates here and really everywhere is whether the U.S. and the global economy is going to enter a recession or not. How much is it going to slow down? Let's talk to someone about that. That is Gary Cohn. He is the vice chair at IBM and, of course, former head of the Council of Economic uh, Advisors for the for the Trump administration. Um, and so, Gary, wh what are you seeing? What are you hearing? I mean, you, you wear a lot of hats, as always. You talk to a lot of people, as always. What's the vibe? Well, you know the vibe here, because everyone is fairly on the bearish side. Everyone's talking about global recessions. Everyone's talking about recessions. But of course, when I talk to people and ask them about their business, they seem to think their business is OK. So everyone here seems to think the other person has a problem. You know, my personal view on this is, you know, I, I think we've weathered the storm in the United States. Um, it feels like we're, we're, we're coming out in a fairly decent place. I do think the Fed will probably raise another couple 25 basis points. They're not quite done yet. I don't think they want to walk away. I think they want to put sort of the nail in the coffin on inflation. But all the data shows that inflation's coming down relatively quickly. And we still see pretty positive economic data. You know, we still see employment growth. We still see GDP in a, in a relatively good position. So I'm still cautiously optimistic going into next year. And, and so I'm, I'm clearly in the more bullish camp for those here in Davos. Were you surprised, Gary, by some of your former peers in the banking industry calling out last week and then also today as well, a mild recession. I, I, I'm not surprised. You know, it's, it's, if you're running a big bank and you're running a big business, I think you have to think about that as a possibility. You know, you have to run your business being prepared for the worst. And if we don't go to a mild recession and we don't have that, it's surely a lot easier to run your business having prepared for that than not having prepared for that. So I understand the mentality. Would this be a Federal Reserve driven recession? I, I'm not going to say it's a Federal Reserve driven recession. You know, we, we clearly had inflation. We clearly had a major supply chain disruption coming out of COVID. You know, we could go through the history. You know, during COVID, we became a purely goods economy. The only thing that was driving the economy were things that the United States Postal Service, UPS, or FedEx could deliver to your house. And so we had this massive demand on goods. And so the supply chain broke down. As we reopened the economy, you know, no one had labor. And we changed from our natural um, 
goods economy to our, our natural supply side economy, excuse me, where we really consume um, we really consume services. So we're an 80% services economy in the United States, but when we went out to start consuming our natural services, no one had workers. So everyone scrambled to get labor back, and it was tough to get labor back in the economy. So we saw quite a bit of wage inflation, and we're still seeing the wage inflation as people are out still trying to enjoy themselves and make up for the lost time that they lost during COVID. You still see you know, the airlines, you still see the hotels, the restaurants are still thriving and trying to hire people back. And as we revert back to our more service-driven economy. So I guess then the question is if it makes sense CEOs are pessimistic because they have to manage their businesses, they have to have an eye on worst case scenarios. What about the markets though? Because there too, you could argue, especially the bond market is looking for maybe even cuts by the end of the year, which would imply that the economy is gonna be doing worse and going to need those cuts. Do they have it wrong? So I, I don't know where rates are today. It's when you're in Davos, you get out of I know. Touch, you we were talking about how isolated you are. Total, total yeah. bubble. Well, I think, well, I guess the U.S. markets are open. <laughs> so they're, yeah. they're open, total bubble. But, you know, the 10-year the, the in the U.S. is trading, you know, 360-ish. I'll give you an ish. Normally, I would know exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and we've got a, a front end, you know, Fed fund rate at uh, four and a half, probably going to four and three quarters, 5%. So the... Treasury market is discounting what's ultimately going to happen in the economy. And the market is, is, is sort of voicing its opinion, I think, relatively strongly. I think the market's right. You know, at the end of the day, as I always say to people, you know, you can trade the market. You know, billions and trillions of dollars are wagered in the treasury market every day and people are expressing their views and you can express your view and you'll be right or wrong uh, based on your opinion the treasury you know has, uh, uh, sorry the fed by the has, way i got i got a little tip in my ear it's three and a half percent today three okay so, <laughs> so by the way lower. so yeah. we're down we're down from where we were last week so think about that so rates yeah. are even lower than they were last week so you know the the the, the, the fed on the other hand you know they can talk they can raise fed funds they can raise the overnight rate they can control what people get on overnight funding, but that's the only part of the mm. curve they can control. Yes, they can use extraordinary measures and they can do twists and they can do QE and they can do QT, but ultimately their, really, their real opportunity is to control the front end of the curve. And, and I think the curve is speaking for itself right now to what people are saying about the U.S. economy. We have this uh, term, and I'm sure you know this, that a, a stock is dead money if a company is not executing. As someone that it, has invested in blockchain and, and even crypto, is Bitcoin dead money here? Do you even touch that? Do you go near it at all? So I have not invested. Not invested in crypto. Not invested in crypto. Blockchain. I want to make that very clear. But you're a blockchain I've, guy. I've invested blockchain in blockchain. Guy. I think blockchain as a tool is a very interesting tool. It's a tool that will modernize mm -hmm. the financial services industry. You know, I lived through sort of the, the revolution of clearing and how we put everything through the, the one of the, the the solutions to the financial crisis was to clear everything. So we went from clearing the most liquid items in the world to clearing everything. I think blockchain is a further evolution on the clearinghouse and it's the, being able to real time clear things and, and move title instantaneously and move cash instantaneously. So I'm, I'm bullish on blockchain. On crypto, I, I really don't have a view on crypto. So do we sort of need to, like reputationally, do we need to divorce blockchain from crypto? 100%. Because it's a technology, right? And it, it can be technology. used in so many other things. I mean, look so, at me, I just lumped it right in together. Yeah, so, no, no. But, but so how do you do that as an investor in it, as someone who wants it to go further? How do you get it to people to sort of so, separate so the two? Block, block, think of blockchain as the clearinghouse. We don't talk about the clearinghouse. You, can't, you don't even know who clears the house, who the clearinghouse right. is, and you don't even know about DTCC. You don't know where the securities are right. settled. We don't, we don't talk about the settlement You don't need agencies. to. Most people don't need right. to. You don't need to. You talk about the individual securities. Um, Bitcoin is the security. It is actually a security. And there's many other securities. People have created other cryptocurrencies. You can talk about them. But the, the blockchain is actually the underlying infrastructure that allows these securities to be, be transacted and to be settled in real time. Gary, you came in an interesting time for IBM. A lot of transformation uh, at the company. New CEO, Arvin yeah. uh, Krishna. Investors still seem doubtful on, on a turnaround. Uh, where is IBM on that turnaround plan? Look, I think Arvin has laid out a, a very uh, distinct plan on revenue growth, on free cash flow growth, and he continues to execute upon his plan. And kind of what are you doing there, <laughs> for lack of a better question? You know, like, what, what do you see as your role there, and, and how do you help with the strategy that he's laid out? Look, I, I came in a couple years ago when Arvin came in as the new chairman and CEO. 
Um, he asked me to come in and, and help him think about his strategy, think about his senior management team, think about what IBM of the future should look like, help them with clients, help them with client relationships. And it's been a really interesting experience to learn about the technology world and the evolution. IBM is still on the forefront of cutting edge technology, which is extraordinary. It's, it's a whole new world for me to learn. It's been a really interesting and fascinating couple of years. Great, Gary Cohn, thank you so much for being here. Vice Chair at IBM, the aforementioned. Thank you for having me. Thanks you. a lot, appreciate it. Despite the stock market decline in 2022, some of Wall Street is optimistic on the year ahead with our next guest saying 2023 will be the year of the bull after we saw the year of patience, frustration and quality in 2022. Heritage Capital President Paul Schatz joins us now. Paul, so great to have you with us. We often hear from so many bears about this year and what will be coming up. Uh, give us your thesis for the year of the bull. Good morning, good to be with you guys again. Look, you come into the year, you've got inflation, an overaggressive Fed, and a weakening economy. You know when that was also seen? That was also seen heading into 1995, which was the single greatest investing year in the modern era. I'm not calling for a 37% rally this year, but look, we're, we come into the new year, everyone is lined up to the, I, I think we could have a mild recession, but my argument is that the market went down 20% on the S&P, 30% on the NASDAQ for a reason. It didn't do so because things were great. It did so because the market saw economic weakness. It saw the Fed raising rates repeatedly. You come into a new year, <clears throat> portfolios are positioned so far to the negative side. It's the third year of Joe Biden's presidency. Since Germany invaded Poland in 1939, we have not had a down third year of a presidency. Mm -hmm. Back-to-back -back down years have only occurred three times since World War II, 1974, 01, and 02. The odds are heavily stacked in the bull's favor. You have the single worst year of the bond, in bond market history and the longest decline in history. High yield bonds have never been down back-to-back -back years. I mean, I feel like everyone positioned like 1994, like 1981 for the absolute worst Who's really left to sell? And so, Paul, even, even with the bullish outlook here, there's so many company CEOs, even from the, the PwC survey, in, even in statements, business updates, that have started to pour in early this year. It, it's clear that some of the CEOs and their executive teams are saying, hey, we just need to rip the Band-Aid off now and let the markets know exactly what we're expecting and how much it could impact our business. And so to what extent do you believe that there, there still is some downside potential or risk given the fact that you do have CEOs saying, you know what, we need to be transparent about the risks that are prevalent and, and present in front of our business. Your, your comments are spot on. I don't think the conclusion of the CEOs is spot on. Look, at the beginning of, of, of 2009, go try to find a single positive forecast from anywhere in corporate America. Market went down the first quarter and the end of the year up you know, 25%. I think CEOs are so scared these days because they're being graded. It used to be on an annual basis. Now they're being graded on a quarterly, almost monthly basis. So they're trying to set expectations low, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best, how, whatever adage you want to use. And, and we all see the economic weakness, but it doesn't mean this, this deep and long recession is coming. I don't think it is. So I, I take what they say. The most important thing is this. We know we're going to get pre-announcements right now through the next month. We know we're going to see companies lower guidance. If the market doesn't hit those stocks more than a couple of percent, I would tell you with highest conviction, the market's priced in whatever mild recession or economic weakness we're going to get in the next three to six months. Mar again, markets trade on economic activity three to nine months down the road. So the CEOs are starting to feel it, see it now. But the markets have already seen this, this play before, and markets are looking ahead. And, and, I'll, and I'll say this as well. For the techno, uh, techno wonks out there, you have an absolute surge in the number of stocks going up versus down to, to, off the December low. And now you've got the up volume to down volume, again, getting a little wonky. And all that means is this for the average investor. It's like a rocket ship taking off. 
All right. Once the rocket ship takes off and reaches that escape velocity, it continues on its own. And that's what these thrusts are in the market. You're going to get, you've had this explosion higher, and that should continue on its own. Go try to find really bullish people on strategists on Wall Street. Everyone's talking about we have to go down to 3,000 or 3,200 first. That's nonsense. And even if I'm wrong on the timing, you could have a 10% decline the first quarter. I don't think so. I think it's going to be a front-loaded year. But even if I'm wrong, buy the weakness in the first quarter, stocks still run 20% from there. I think it's it, year of the bull in stocks, year of the bull in bonds, year of the bull in gold, buy all into weakness. You'll be happy in, in 12 months. Uh, so, right, so buying the weakness, uh, tell me, what are, what are you looking at? I mean, what should investors be buying? Uh, what stocks, what sectors do you feel will outperform? Well, for sure, the market's telling us right now, if you look at leadership right now, market's telling us that, you know, if you want to take a little risk, I like semiconductors this year and I'll, and biotech. I'll be alone on my island. That's OK. I like being in the, in the vast minority. But the market's told you already, financials, materials, technology, the risk on sectors. One sector that I'm not ex extremely excited about this year is energy. It had two monster years in 2020 and 2021. And I think it's time you, you pull energy off the table, pull staples and utilities and the defenses, put them aside, maybe second half of the year, maybe 2024. But I think you've got to stick with the risk on uh, sectors and indices, small caps are leading. A lot of good things are happening if people just open their eyes look at the data in the market and not look at the listen to the narratives out there it's easy to spin a narrative on wall street despite the stock market decline in 2022 some of wall street is optimistic on the year ahead with our next guest saying 2023 will be the year of the bull after we saw the year of patience frustration and quality in 2022 heritage capital president paul schatz joins us now paul so great to have you with us we often hear from so many bears about this year and what will be coming up uh, give us your thesis for the year of the bull Good morning. Good to be with you guys again. Look, you come into the year, you've got inflation, an overaggressive Fed, and a weakening economy. You know when that was also seen? That was also seen heading into 1995, which was the single greatest investing year of the modern era. I'm not calling for a 37% rally this year, but look, we're, we come into the new year, everyone is lined up to the, I, I think we could have a mild recession, but my argument is that the market went down 20% on the S&P, 30% on the NASDAQ for a reason. It didn't do so because things were great. It did so because the market saw economic weakness. It saw the Fed raising rates repeatedly. You come into a new year, <clears throat> portfolios are positioned so far to the negative side. It's the third year of Joe Biden's presidency. Since Germany invaded Poland in 1939, we have not had a down third year of a presidency. Mm -hmm. Back-to-back -back down years have only occurred three times since World War II, 1974, 01, and 02. The odds are heavily stacked in the bulls' favor. You have the single worst year of the bond and bond market history and the longest decline in history. High yield bonds have never been down back-to-back -back years. I mean, I feel like everyone positioned like 1994, like 1981 for the absolute worst. Who's really left to sell? And so, Paul, even, even with the bullish outlook here, there's so many company CEOs, even from the, the PwC survey, in, even in statements, business updates, that have started to pour in early this year. It, it's clear that some of the CEOs and their executive teams are saying, hey, we just need to rip the Band-Aid off now and let the markets know exactly what we're expecting and how much it could impact our business. And so to what extent do you believe that there, there still is some downside potential or risk, given the fact that you do have CEOs saying, you know what, we need to be transparent about the risks that are prevalent and, and present in front of our business? Your, your comments are spot on. I don't think the conclusion of the CEOs is spot on. Look, at the beginning of, of, of 2009, Go try to find a single positive forecast from anywhere in corporate America. Market went down the first quarter and the end of the year up, you know, 25 percent. 
I think CEOs are so scared these days because they're being graded. It used to be on an annual basis. Now they're being graded on a quarterly, almost monthly basis. So they're trying to set expectations low, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best, how whatever adage you want to use. And and we all see the economic weakness, but it doesn't mean this this deep and long recession is coming. I don't think it is. So I, I take what they say. The most important thing is this. We know we're going to get pre-announcements right now through next month. We know we're going to see companies lower guidance. If the market doesn't hit those stocks more than a couple of percent, I would tell you with highest conviction, the market's priced in whatever mild recession or economic weakness we're going to get in the next three to six months. Mar again, markets trade on economic activity three to nine months down the road. So the CEOs are starting to feel it, see it now. But the markets have already seen this, this play before, and markets are looking ahead. And, and, I'll, and I'll say this as well. For the techno, uh, techno wonks out there, you have an absolute surge in the number of stocks going up versus down to, to off the December low. And now you've got the up volume to down volume, again, getting a little wonky. And all that means is this for the average investor. It's like a rocket ship taking off. All right. Once the rocket ship takes off and reaches that escape velocity, it continues on its own. And that's what these thrusts are in the market. You're going to get you've had this explosion higher and that should continue on its own. Go try to find really bullish people on strategists on Wall Street. Everyone's talking about we have to go down to 3000 or 3200 first. That's nonsense. And even if I'm wrong on the timing, you could have a 10% decline the first quarter. I don't think so. I think it's going to be a front-loaded year. But even if I'm wrong, by the weakness in the first quarter, stocks still run 20% from there. I think it's it, year of the bull in stocks, year of the bull in bonds, year of the bull in gold, buy all into weakness. You'll be happy in, in 12 months. Uh, so, right, so buying the weakness, uh, tell me, what uh, are what are you looking at? I mean, what should investors be buying? Uh, what stocks, what sectors do you feel will outperform? Well, for sure, the market's telling us right now, if you look at leadership right now, market's telling us that, you know, if you want to take a little risk, I like semiconductors this year and I'll, and biotech. I'll be alone on my island. That's OK. I like being in the, in the vast minority. But the market's told you already, financials, materials, technology, the risk on sectors. One sector that I'm not ex extremely excited about this year is energy. It had two monster years in 2020 and 2021. And I think it's time you, you pull energy off the table, pull staples and utilities and the defenses, put them aside, maybe second half of the year, maybe 2024. But I think you've got to stick with the risk on uh, sectors and indices, small caps are leading. A lot of good things are happening if people just open their eyes look at the data in the market and not look at the listen to the narratives out there it's easy to spin a narrative on wall street rbc capital markets is anticipating a modest gain for the s p 500 this year the investment bank putting its year-end price target for the index at 4100 for more on the analysis behind this call let's go and get to the rbc head of u.s equity strategy Lori calvacina Lori, always a pleasure to speak with you i believe this is our first time touching base in the new year so happy new year to you i think so ha thanks for having me absolutely um and so help us walk through this target 4100 by the end of the year is it a straight line there? Is it kind of a lot of choppiness to get to that point? What is it from your point? I, I think it's a, I think it's a choppiness. I think it's going to feel like a rough year. I expect us, I expect us to eke out a little bit of a gain, maybe you know, kind of a flattish type year is how it's going to feel at the end of the day. Um, look, I, I do think there's a chance that we have some decent volatility in the first quarter, and I know we've had a good start to the year, um, but you know, we're sort of watching the banks react to earnings today, and it's a good reminder that the onset of tougher earnings and the onset of a tougher economy um, is something I think markets are going to have some trouble digesting. Now, I'm not as bearish as some of my peers in the strategy community. I'm not arguing for 3,000 on the S&P. I think this is more of a retest, if that, of the October lows. But I think we've, we've got some wood to chop here. 
what do you think is going to be supportive? Why do you think things aren't going to be worse and aren't going to, say, retest the lows or go even lower? So I think it goes back to what kind of recession do you ultimately expect us to have and how does that get reflected in markets? So the October low we had was about a 25% drawdown. A typical recession is 27. If you're going to get to even 3,200 on the S&P, that's pricing in more like a 32% decline. And remember, the pandemic was just 34. So we think it's going to be that bad. I'm still not convinced of that. Um, the other thing is we think earnings expectations, they are a headwind now, but markets, if you look at S&P pricing, typically find a bottom three to six months before earnings forecasts stop falling. Now, when do we think earnings forecasts are going to stop falling? Most years, we do tend to see that the cuts are done by April for the most part. So if you can kind of get most of the cuts done by March or April, timing-wise, that October low makes sense. Laurie, within the sectors that you track from a, a company perspective, you know, we had a JP Morgan calling out today. Uh, they're playing their business on a, a potential mild recession. Are there sectors that you see earnings estimates have already factored in a mild recession? So I think that if you look at an area like semiconductors, um, we've seen the rate of upward revisions basically late last year plummeted to almost zero. And what we typically see there is when you're that low, most of the cuts are in and it's a good setup on a 12 month forward basis. I can contrast that with something like software where we haven't seen the same degree of cuts. So I worry a little bit more about software and services companies than semiconductor companies, you know, just in this reporting season, because I think one of them you probably had most of the cuts in. And the other, I feel like they're still from a sentiment perspective perspective, at least, you know, some earnings downgrades that need to happen. The other area I worry about, you know, we're going through financials right now. It's been, it's a sector we like this year, um, but it's been more resilient in terms of earnings expectations. So do some of these leaders, some of these areas of resiliency, like energy and financials, utilities, real estate, do they need to take their licks before we can get this downgrade cycle out of the way? Right, because maybe the estimates haven't come down enough. Um, one area that you have consistently liked for a while now has been small caps. Yes. We've been talking about it for a little while. I was just taking a look at the Russell 2000 which is down 13% or so over the past 52 weeks, not as big a drop as the S&P 500. Are we going to start to, I mean, there's not a big gap, though, in between yeah. the two. Are we going to start to see that gap grow? I think so. And, you know, I was actually looking this morning at the year-to-date stats on the S&P versus the Russell 2000, and small caps are stealthily outperforming. I mean, I think we're up like 5 6% on the Russell um, and not quite as much on the S&P, closer to like 2 3%. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to see, like, every little day that the small caps do a little bit better, it's adding up. And the small caps, they made their low in June, didn't make a new low in October, um, really have been outperforming since mid-May with, you know, giving some of it back in December, but very quietly they're emerging as this pocket of resilience. And I think it's pretty clear that if you look at how they were trading over the summer versus large, they were baking in ISM manufacturing that had already plunged to like 39. Um, so small caps just got this recession trade out of the way very, very early. And we've had this sloppy catch down in large cap that may not be completely done playing out yet. Hmm. Lori Calvacina, RBC Capital Markets Head of U.S. Equity Strategy. Have a great weekend. Talk Thanks. to you soon. Earnings season kicked off with a bang today after big banks. J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America all reported earnings this morning. Here to break down those numbers is S&P Global Market Intelligence Director Nathan Stovall. Nathan, great to have you here with us. If we're kind of painting a, a broad stroke across some of the bank earnings this morning and extrapolating one thing that could be an underlying theme or a common denominator for the rest of the earnings season. What do you think that might be? I, I think it really comes to the outlook. You know, we thought Q4 was going to be pretty strong, and, and the results that have come in ha have supported that. You know, we've seen strong revenue growth pretty across the board, strong loan growth, continued increases in deposit costs, but again, that was expected. But also really, really strong credit quality. You know, no real deterioration yet, but the question was going to be what was the outlook going forward? And what we've seen is not anything really negative, but as you were talking about earlier in the show, the outlook that now JP Morgan is baking in that expectation for a mild recession. Uh, so slower growth going forward, higher credit costs going forward. And I don't think it's necessarily that much negative, but you got to look at what the group was trading on leading up to this. Bank stocks had taken pretty great pressure most of 22, but we had seen a little bit of a rebound with perhaps the hope that maybe the Fed would pivot with the idea that they wouldn't want to push the economy into a recession. And now you've got some big bank executives saying that that is becoming sort of their base case. So going forward, I think that's really what the street is going to be focused on. You know, what is the outlook for credit and, and really the broader economy going forward? I wouldn't say that it's necessarily that dire 
but investors are hoping that it would be sort of continued blue skies. So Nathan, if these stocks are going to trade off uh, that recession call by JP Morgan and to a lesser extent Wells Fargo, I mean, so do you see more downside uh, in the coming weeks to these names? Well, when you look at where they're trading at historically, they're pretty cheap, arguably. So you could argue right now that the expectation for a recession is, is built in. We just had seen a little bit of a rebound in some of these names, JPM in particular. So when they come out and they, and they throw out the expectation that you're going to see slower growth coming forward, I think that weighs on the name. But even more so, and, and you had mentioned this earlier on the show, the net interest income guidance came in a little bit lighter than was expected. And I think that that's a little bit weight on the stock too, but it, it really is going to be what is the outlook relative to where people thought any sort of bit of bad news that kind of supports that negative bear case for the group, I think will add to some pressure, but it, it's not necessarily going to put severe pressure on the group. Nathan, it's Julie here. You know, the theory is, right, is that rising rates help the banks, right? That the net interest income tends to expand at times like this, even if the economy is slowing and that hits, say, deposit growth or loan growth. So talk to us about how you're thinking about how most of the banks have to balance those two this year and whether they're going to be successful. Sure. And that's the name of the game. I mean, higher rates are good for banks, and we're seeing that play out in Q4. And and ultimately, you know, we think fundamental trends look pretty strong, but that balance of loans growing at a much quicker pace than deposits and deposits even sort of flowing out of the bank is the challenge that the bankers have right now. And we're starting to see liquidity pressures arise, and that has been sort of the biggest thing and talking point that we've had over the last few weeks, not only in terms of deposit costs going higher, and we did see that play through on these big banks results, but also the idea that maybe liquidity will be a little bit more fleeting. And we think that will continue to play out uh, over 23, though we're not really in the camp that it's going to be as negative as some. So yes, there will be some outliers, but ultimately we've been in the camp that what you will see is that deposit rates will continue to go higher. That's good for consumers, uh, but it's bad for bank margins. And so you get to a place where bank margins peak sometime this year. And Thus far, we're, we haven't really gotten any real clear read through to that, but the net interest income guidance from JP Morgan sort of supports that thinking that we're getting closer to a peak soon. And, and the banks that are able to kind of buck that trend and really hold the line on deposit cost are going to be the ones that really significantly outperform uh, going forward. We've got Sanctuary Wealth Chief Investment Strategist Marianne Bartels and JP Morgan Senior Economist Stephanie Roth here with me on set. Thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. So looking at these numbers, has the Fed done enough? I mean, if you look at the components that fell the most, it was energy prices, which the Fed doesn't have anything to do with, really. So what's your read on this report? I think we can say that inflation has peaked. But the level of inflation is nowhere near where the Fed wants to be. So they're going to continue to tighten a little bit. And they've been very clear on their message is that they want to get up to around 5%, maybe a little bit higher, and stay there for the rest of the year. I found it very interesting that no one on uh, the Fed uh, FOMC is forecasting a rate cut this year, although the market is right. forecasting the rate cut. So I think they're going to try to stay as tight as long as they possibly can, because the last thing they want to do is make a mistake and ease too quickly. You know, when you go back to Jackson Hole, Powell uh, said in a statement they were going to keep at it. And I think that was a clear message that he's going to follow the Volcker path. He wants to squash inflation. Stephanie, we're always looking at this through the prism of the markets, what it might mean to the Fed and, and various stocks. What does it mean to the average household? Because I, I know uh, inflation slowed down month over month. That is a good thing. But egg price is still up 11 percent year over year. Rent price is up. Are these still the type of inflationary numbers that would put the U.S. economy into a consumer driven recession? Yeah, it certainly is a challenge for the consumer. And I would say even the, the, the bigger concern is the outlook in that in, with the Fed hiking up to 5% and staying there for a year, it's likely to cause a recession, which is going to be a, a challenge for consumers because recession likely means layoffs. So, so people might, might ultimately lose their job as, as a result. But the Fed is fighting inflation from the top side. They don't want to worry about inflation getting out of control. So they're, they're likely to stay tighter for longer. 
And the print that we saw today is, is consistent with the Fed continuing to hike, even if they do step down to, to 25 basis points. So uh, a, a Fed that remains tight for, for this long is likely to put downward pressure on the economy, and the consumer is likely to, to feel it in a, in a different kind of way, not just from a price pressure perspective, but now from a, the perspective that, that, that they might start losing their, their jobs, which is a, a very challenging outlook. Yeah, Saz is always very focused on the egg prices that continue to Have go to be, Julie. up Have and to be. up and up. But it's avian flu, which the Fed can't. Yeah, we all eat them. There's only so we much the Fed can Julie. do about that. Um, I, I want to talk about the market reaction a little bit that we're seeing this morning, because it is interesting that we are seeing stock futures now higher. Did anything change in the outlook from this report, in your view, and why are we seeing stocks react like this, Miriam? I, I don't think that there's anything changed. Um, I think this is very technical in nature. Um, in December, the market sold off. We got very oversold technical readings. I think we're working off those oversold. I think as the S&P approaches 4,000 up near the 200-day moving average, I think there's risk that we still go down. I still believe we're in a bear market. The risk is we're still going to come down and test those October lows. And the big question is, will we hold those October lows? And I think a big component that will help us determine that is we're moving into earnings season. The big day is tomorrow with the banks reporting, is where are we in earnings? Because the top-down strategists have taken down their numbers. Bottom-up analysts have not really taken down their numbers. They're looking for earnings to actually increase 5.5% for the S&P. So I think it's going to be very important to listen uh, to the CEOs about what their outlook is for their business for 2023. And we might see adjustments in earnings. But what we've been telling our clients, as long as the Fed is raising rates, that's going to cause volatility in both the equity market and the bond market. And then if you still have to take the numbers down for the S&P, that's also going to create volatility. But we do see a bull running, and no one is talking about where the bull is running. Oh, well, that's a Marianne, big tease. What, hey, go ahead, go ahead, Zaz. <laughs> right. You know, Mary, let me just follow up on that, because you know, what is what should investors pay attention more now to what the Fed may or may not put out into the market in terms of language and policy? Or is it this earnings season, which kicks off tomorrow with the banks and may not be too good, like you mentioned? Well, I, I think the Fed has been very clear on their policy. They're going to stay as tight as much as possible for as long as possible. So I, I, I think that message is very clear. I don't think the earnings picture is, is clear. And I think we really have to pay attention um, to earnings. But what's very interesting about the market is you have a bear market in a pocket of stocks and you have a bull market already in another pocket of stocks. And the reason why we're not seeing the bull is their market cap is too low. So even though they're rising and many of these stocks are hitting record all-time highs, the decline in the growth stocks is too much to it's outweighing what's happening in 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 the value side and the easy way to look at this energy we think is part of this new bull run and energy only represents six percent no five percent of the s p where apple which is part of the growth names and it's a great company but expensive business is shifting and that represents six percent of the market so there's a big difference in terms of where the bear is, and the bear has a lot of market cap, it's growth, um, it's tech, it's FANG. We're, what we're doing is we're repricing those stocks on a PE basis. They just got expensive, well, you've got to deflate them down. Market is shifting to value, that's where the new bull is, but we just don't see it because their market cap is just not able to compete with the growth market cap. Interesting, and we're gonna talk actually to a, a value-focused investor later in the hour who also has some picks for us, so that should be interesting. Stephanie, um, when your shop looks at the, the whole stock versus bond debate, right? Everybody loves fixed income going into 2023. Are you guys in the same camp? And again, does any of that change given what inflation print we got today and what we might continue to get? No, we continue to, to like stocks or uh, bonds over stocks. Um, the bond outlook is, is pretty attractive. You have yields that are pretty elevated. Uh, on top of that, you can have capital appreciation. If this recession view plays out, you'll get a, a, a decent return in your fixed income. And even if it doesn't, even if we end up in a soft landing, you'll have a, a nice yield, and you could even get a little bit of capital appreciation with yields falling from current levels. So we, that's the area of, of the market that we like the most. And then when it comes to the stock market, we're a little bit more selective. So like Marianne just said, smaller cap is interesting today. Their valuation is, is at, a, at a more attractive level. 
Um, and that's the area of the market that, that we would be putting money to. So it's certainly core fixed income. That's the, the most attractive part of the market for us today, uh, especially given our outlook for, for challenging road ahead, especially on the earnings front. And then small and mid caps. I love you are almost literally pounding the table on that train <laughs> to, use, to use a well-worn phrase, Saz. Stephanie, uh, let me just I'll follow up on that too as well. Within your outlook for stocks and, and fixed income, when do you see the Fed cutting rates or do you see any rate cuts this year? We expect rate cuts in the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, we expect recession to hit around the third quarter. So we expect about, about a quarter lag for the Fed to be con convinced that inflation has come back down. And then we expect cuts in, in, the, in the fourth quarter. Um, Marianne, you, you said in your notes as well that 60-40 looks good again, which uh, kind of fits in with what Stephanie's saying about fixed income coming back and being a part of the portfolio, right? A absolutely. So 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds is a traditional asset allocation uh, that is used. And we've said 60-40 is back. And it was never going to be an easy path going from the zero bound to getting interest rates again. But we've been through the pain. The bear market was last year in, in bonds and stocks, which is very, very rare. And we think this year, yes, bonds are going to do very well, probably even better than stocks. We would agree with that. Uh, but we I think eventually stocks will bottom out and rally this year. I think you're going to have a bull both in the bond market and the equity market. But what people are also not talking about is you can also now put cash in a portfolio. So you can really use stocks, bonds, cash, because even cash is yielding higher than some of the bonds. Yeah. So asset allocation is back. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> a, a hopeful note here to end it. Thank you so much, ladies. Appreciate it. Sanctuary Wealth Chief Investment Strategist Marianne Bartels and J.P. Morgan Senior Economist Stephanie Roth. Thanks to you both. Really appreciate it. We are about, oh, 13 minutes into the trading day today, and stocks are hanging on to some modest gains right now. Investor concerns over higher rates, though, are still at the core of the outlook for 2023. Federal Reserve officials point towards the likelihood of interest rates rising above 5 percent as Jay Powell defends the Fed taking measures that are not popular to rein in inflation. For a closer look at the market reaction, we have Jackie Cavanaugh, Putnam Focused Equity Fund Portfolio Manager. Jackie, welcome. Thanks for being here. We heard Jay Powell talk this morning over in Sweden. He didn't say a heck of a lot that seemed to move the market except from just saying we're staying the course effectively. So just first of all, I guess, give us your, your big picture view for 2023 and what that's going to mean for stocks. Sure. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I wouldn't expect Chair Powell to say anything during his prepared remarks, as you mentioned earlier in the show. Um, I could see him saying potentially something defending his stance during the Q&A, so that'll bear some watching. I do think, though, as we think about what we're facing for 2023, we think it's going to be a tough year, particularly the first half of the year. You know, the Fed continues to signal that their terminal rate is likely to be north of 5%. You had two chair governors out, Fed governors out yesterday discussing this, and yet the market is fighting the Fed. I mean, the two-year continues to hover at like two, four, two, four, three. The ten-year is trending at three and a half, and this is just not what the Fed wants to see. And so, while he is saying that some of the moves will be unpopular, are likely to lead to some job losses, they view it necessary to rein in inflation. And the real place that they have to get at is wages and wage growth. And so the jobs market remaining so tight is really problematic for the Fed. So we think the terminal rate is probably five or north of five. And then we think we sit there for most of 2023 and they just wait for that jobs market to loosen up and to take the risk of a wage price spiral off the table, which is what they're really concerned about. What do you believe valuations need to come down to as we're kicking off this next earnings season? Yeah, so if you've gone back and look at prior recessions and prior market bottoms, what you typically see is that, you know, obviously the GFC and the tech bubble were anomalies. But when you look at a garden variety recession, which we think is what you're facing here, either a slowdown or a very shallow recession, we would think about an S&P in sort of the 15 to 16 times range on a forward multiple. When I last checked, I think it was trading around 17 and a half times. So we do think there's still some room for some, let's call it 10% margin compression. 
Where I think you still have some risk, though, as well, and you were talking about this earlier, is I still think you have some earnings areas that need to take some cuts, where you're going to see some downward earnings revisions, maybe coming out of Q4, and then continuing as we progress through 2023. You know, you certainly saw Lululemon earlier this week. They took a hit at their guidance. Illumina, you were mentioning. We expect you'll continue to see some of that over the next um, earnings cycle of Q4. Jackie, the, uh, the difference between the yield on the two and 10 year treasury note, uh, it's at its widest in about 40 years. And to some that's a surefire re recession signal. I mean, as you take a step back, do you think something like that all but guarantees a recession this year? So, you know, that is an interesting metric and it's certainly one that we track the, the yield curve inversion and it has historically been an indicator. It has indicated every recession, that is true, but not every yield curve inversion has led to a recession. So I, I hope you understand that distinction, right? Which is that just because it's inverted doesn't necessarily mean um, recession, although every recession has been preceded by an inversion. We think here, though, you are likely to get a recession. It may be very shallow. I don't think it's going to be a you know a cataclysm like we had in the GFC, but we do think a recession is the most likely outcome. They're trying desperately to engineer a soft landing, and you are getting pockets of areas where inflation is really starting to help them out, particularly on the good side. But services inflation just remains really strong, and that's driven by the labor market. And the labor market, as you know, is at a 50-year low on unemployment and just remains incredibly tight with job openings still two to one versus a people available for jobs, people who are unemployed. And so that needs to loosen for the Fed to be able to declare victory here. Uh, Jackie, I know you like the banks here. And so I want to delve into that a little bit, because on the one hand, rates going up tend to be good for banks. On the other hand, if we're even if we're not going into recession, even if we just see weakening economic growth, that doesn't tend to be so great for the banks. So how do you see them threading that needle? Yeah, so I think you've hit the nail on the head, Julie, which is that on the revenue side, higher rates and the longer duration of higher rates is clearly a positive for the banks. And we don't believe the duration of higher rates is really in, everyone knows rates is going up. So that is in the bank forecast. What I think is underappreciated is how long we're gonna sit at higher rates and the duration of those higher revenue lines for the banks is gonna be longer. You're right though, that comes with a cost and the cost is usually, usually expressed through the credit line and through credit losses. I think the thing you have to remember here though, is that credit is coming from an unbelievably strong place. I mean, we are so far off of historical credit averages. We're still near all time lows in terms of credit losses and credit delinquencies. So you will get normalization. You will get weakening, particularly if you have job losses. But we think that's going to be very manageable for the banks. In fact, most of the banks, when you talk to them, they're already provisioning for a 5% unemployment rate, which we think feels about right. So you have the benefit on the top line of higher for longer. You have credit costs which will rise, but which will remain very manageable. And then you have valuations where virtually all of the banks, not all the regionals, but the bigger banks are trading below the historical price to book averages. So we actually think it's a very good setup for the banks. I think it's going to take time for people to appreciate that the duration is longer so that the earnings duration is longer for the banks to re-rate. But we think it's a very attractive segment within the market today. Jackie, in recent earnings periods, we've heard banks say that the consumer is resilient and then say that the consumer is healthy. This earnings period, how do you expect them to classify the sentiment among consumers or the health of consumers? I think the data and the facts support that the consumer remains very healthy. You continue to have over a trillion dollars in excess savings versus where you were pre-pandemic. The consumer remains in a strong place in terms of excess savings. The consumer has a job, which gives them confidence to continue to spend. They have confidence if they lose their job, they can quickly, maybe not easily, but quickly replace that job. So I would expect the characterization of consumers and earnings this quarter to remain reasonably strong and pretty robust. You know, ability to spend, money to spend, and desire to spend. Um, I think where you could start to see some caution is on the outlook, right? As you start to see, you know, increasing job, you know, obviously we had the Coinbase announcement this morning, increasing job losses, headlines around increasing job losses, which does drive confidence issues in the consumer. So the outlook might be weaker, but I think the data this quarter is very clearly going to support a 
a consumer that remains very robust and very resilient. Um, and again, you just don't see any cracks on the consumer credit numbers at all. Some slight tick ups in delinquency, but really remain very solid. Hmm, interesting. Well, we'll see what, what gets borne out in some of the uh, corporate earnings as well. Jackie Cavanaugh, Putnam Focused Equity Fund Portfolio Manager. Great to catch up with you this morning. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Folks, there is your closing bell on Wall Street for this Monday as we start the week. Let's take a look where the markets finished today. And the Dow's been a, a wild ride this afternoon. Finishes up down 112 points. And the S&P barely in the red, just losing 3%. The Nasdaq really the winner today based on, largely speaking, a big jump for Tesla. Solid day for Apple, up 66 points. Here's an interesting number. The S&P finishes the year up 83% of the time when the first five days finish in the positive, so a barometer perhaps of the year ahead. Let's take a closer look at the broader markets and bring in Matt Stuckey, Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Senior Portfolio Strategist. Matt, nice to see you. What do you make of the market action today? And getting back to that stat, the first five full days of trading, what have we learned? Well, I think we uh, we have a continuation of what we've been dealing with last year, which is a lot of volatility, <clears throat> a few days up, a few days down in a row. And really what you're left with is kind of where you started. And it's kind of how we kind of see 2023 shaping up. We do see a, a narrative uh, pivoting from inflation worries towards recession worries, which just means until the economy troughs and the Federal Reserve starts to back off, you know, this this volatility back and forth is likely to persist. Matt, you mentioned recession worries there. What are you expecting? Do you think we will get a recession and how severe could it potentially be? Yeah, that's the big debate right now. You know, the debate between recession versus soft landing. And, you know, we're kind of starting to talk about our outlook from a macro perspective as more of a soft recession, uh, something that is shallower and probably shorter than prior recessions, especially the most recent ones where we saw massive reductions in GDP and increases in unemployment. Uh, but if you look at what's in front of us, we have the bond market that's as, as deeply as, as inverted as uh, we've seen the last 40 plus years. We have leading economic indicators from the conference board that are negative 7.3. You've never been at these levels before and not had some sort of recession here in the United States. And you, know, you put on top of that, though, what makes us optimistic that you know things are going to probably be a little bit less severe it's it's the shape of consumers it's the shape of businesses and banks all well capitalized with strong balance sheets which should help to weather the storm pretty well yeah you mentioned those banks those bank earnings start pouring in on friday what do you expect that we'll learn at the end of the week i'm not sure we're going to learn a whole lot uh from banks as we as we look to the upcoming prints uh, later on this week Capital levels should should stay pretty pretty resilient. Uh, credit performance should stay pretty good, although normalizing back towards pre-pandemic levels. Capital market activity, however, from investment banking uh, as well as equity and debt issuance and trading, should be you know somewhat muted as a continuation of what we saw last year. But you know the bright spot is you know banks are still lending. They're still seeing net interest income rise, which should help help put. Uh, together fairly decent results. But, you know, the, the big question a lot of investors are going to have is around credit. And, you know, that we, we're not going to know until we start to see the labor market start to crack a little bit. How much crack do you think we're going to see in the labor market? Because I think the big question is whether or not we need to see substantial job loss, how weak it needs to get in order to see significant inflation improvement. What do you think? Yeah, right now, I, th I think we're seeing some mixed signals in, in labor. And, you know, to be honest, the labor markets have been a lot more resilient than we would have expected at this point. You know, last Friday, we got the jobs report and, you know, the headline number was pretty good. Uh, but, you know, underneath the surface, there were some mixed signals, which I think kind of sparked the rally this past Friday. We saw uh, average hourly earnings miss expectations and come uh, come in underneath uh, what the market was expecting. That's, that's a good sign in terms of um, 
inflationary pressure starting to come off as it relates to labor tightness. We also saw average uh, work weeks move lower, uh, the second lowest uh, level they've been at since the pandemic started, which just means that companies are seeing moderating demand. And as a result of that, they're starting to require less hours from their workers uh, to meet that demand, which should bring the overall labor pressures uh, down a little bit, which is what the Fed wants to see. Speaking of the Fed, Mary Daly says inflation low 3% later this year. Is that where you project? We actually think it might be a little bit lower than that. Um, if we're looking at the inflation story today, I, you know, just look at the last five months of, of CPI prints. We're going to get another one this Thursday, and we think it's going to be a continuation of this trend, which is strip out the lagging parts of, of inflation. Uh, shelter is, is the big one here. Uh, and, and look with what you're left with. And it's a cumulative negative inflation number, uh, a negative 0.2% over the last five inflation reports if you strip out the lagging uh, shelter uh, component, which, as we all know, uh, enters into CPI with a one to one and a half year lag. And if you're if you're looking for kind of your more up to date kind of pulse of the market uh, shelter inflation numbers, those numbers are negative. If you're looking at home prices or uh, month on month rent rent uh, rent levels, those are moving lower. And so that's kind of baked into the cake for kind of where inflation is going to likely be as we move throughout 2023 and and into into next year. Um, you know, the downward pressure is certainly starting to to show through here. So Matt, how does all this then shape your investment strategy and what you like now? Well, you know, we, we're fairly balanced as it as it relates to overall equities versus fixed income. Uh, we did move a, a, a sizable amount into high quality fixed income at the end of the third quarter, um, as we see a lot of value restoration into into the bond market. But you know, we don't necessarily think it's it's time to just shelter up and and, and hide away from risk assets. Uh, there are parts of the market that we continue to find uh, attractive valuations. Um, th- those aren't necessarily found in the S and P 500. We do find those, however and U.S. small caps and U.S. mid caps and international equities that have very large value spreads relative to where the S&P 500 trades. But even within the S&P 500, if you take more of a value factor, look at it, uh, there are values there that trade you know, 11, 12 times forward earnings, which gives you a lot of cushion if, if estimates get cut as we move throughout this year with the recession on the horizon that uh, a lot of valuation discount is already kind of embedded into the price here. We enter 2023 amid major Fed tightening, high inflation, and tech layoffs. What can we expect from the economy throughout the year? Here with some predictions is Sarah Johnson, S&P Global Market Intelligence Executive Director. Sarah, nice to see you. Let's start with inflation, the big question on everyone's mind. And Mary Daly from the Fed says 3% by later this year, which would be welcome news for the consumer. What's your projection? Well, for the U.S., we're projecting uh, a significant deceleration uh, in consumer price inflation. Depends on which indicator you look at, but um, the Federal Reserve tends to be focused on uh, the personal consumption uh, deflator, the core deflator. And yeah, yes, that could easily uh, get down to the three and a half percent range by the end of this year. Globally, I, we you know we see inflation at about well last year seven point seven percent this year about five percent and next year three percent. I mean, Sarah, what does all this then signal just about how aggressive the Fed needs to be in order to meet those inflation goals and what that means for the odds of a recession, whether or not we still have maybe the option or the ability to avoid one at this point. Well, the recent news has been somewhat encouraging in that labor cost increases have been a bit milder than uh, previously reported. Uh, We've seen significant declines in industrial commodity prices over uh, the past nine months. And um, we see some normalization of supply chains. So uh, clearly disinflationary forces are at work, but we are concerned that labor markets remain extremely tight and um, we will have to uh, suffer some increases in unemployment be, uh, to avoid uh, a protracted period of above target inflation. Though we, it's, it's just hard to see it. Three and a half percent, that labor market to your point remains extraordinarily tight, continues hot month after month. Where do you see it going throughout this year in terms of our unemployment rate? 
Our forecast has the unemployment rate rising to a little over 5% by the end of this year. So yes, we see we see a mild recession over the first two quarters of this year, uh, helping to bring down uh, both top line inflation as well as labor cost inflation. And Sarah, when it comes to the U.S. dollar, certainly likely to be a topic that we are going to hear from a number of companies over the several weeks when we get uh, earnings season underway. We are certainly have seen some improvement when it comes to U.S. dollar index pulling back just a bit right now at 103. Do you think that trend, the downward trend that we've seen in recent weeks, is that going to stick this year? I would expect that um, the there might be some downward drift, but not significantly. We believe the dollar peaked uh, last fall and uh, will come down as other countries raise their interest rates. Uh, but uh, I'd say interest rate differentials will continue to favor a relatively strong dollar, but we could see some corrections uh, in the yen, for example, which uh, had an exceptional move during 2022. So I'd look for a somewhat stronger yen. Uh, the euro will probably hold on to its recent gains, uh, particularly given the more hawkish um, sentiment from the European Central Bank. The housing market has seen month after month of really difficult data. How far do you see mortgage rates coming down, flattening out? And what about home prices, your projections for 23? We expect that mortgage rates uh, will edge down a bit, but rem certainly remain far above where they were uh, a year ago. So the outlook for housing demand is um, certainly not uh, an optimistic one. We expect further weakness in home sales and housing starts, uh, home prices, We'll probably have a peak to trough decline of about 10% nationwide, but uh, certainly steeper declines in some of the uh, markets that were exceptionally hot during 2021 and 2022. Certainly going to be a tough start to the year for housing. Sarah Johnson, thanks so much for joining us. December jobs numbers are, of course, in. 223,000 jobs were added. The unemployment rate ticked down to 3.5%. Our next guest says this continues to signal that recession fears are perhaps overdone. For more on this, eToro global market strategist Ben Laidler is joining us right now. Hi, Ben. It's good to see you. So does this mean the soft landing is indeed possible? I think it does. This is really a sort of Goldilocks report. I mean, we've got enough of the sort of slowdown indicators to make us feel that, you know, inflation is going to come down and the Fed can sort of back off. But, you know, 220,000 jobs a month is completely inconsistent with uh, with, with the recession. And, and, and I guess we're seeing that um, in, in some other indicators as well. So, um, you know, definitely, I think you're seeing some relief today. Um, you know, we, we've had some very strong other jobs numbers in the last few um uh, you know, the ADP report and the JOLTS report, which I guess got people a little bit worried that maybe we were running a little bit too hot. And I think some of those concerns got, just got put to bed today. If you're the Fed looking at this report, uh, what do you think to yourself? I don't think it really changes their trajectory too much. Um, I think it's probably, you know, what they're looking for. Uh, again, I think I mean, similar to the rest of us, there's probably a little bit of relief, right? We've had a lot of volatility in this report over time. But I think as you look through it, um, whether it's the revisions to the last number, which came down, whether it's this number, which is, you know, a pretty big, pretty chunky decline, whether it's the deceleration in that in the wage growth numbers. I mean, just take a step back. I mean, this is all about, you know, inflation, 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 all, almost all the other inflation indicators have decisively turned down, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's goods numbers, whether it's uh, commodities, whether it's supply chains, you know, even the sort of housing, the forward looking housing indicators, the one that's missing is the labor market. Uh, so I think, the, the, and, and the fact that it's lagging is not a surprise. The fact that it's now moving, if but gradually in the right direction, I think will be, a, is a sigh of relief for the market, but also to your point to the Fed. Ben, we've seen markets really gain strength uh, consistently today after this report. Uh, do you fade this rally though? I think we're early in this sort of innings. I, I don't think the inflation 
story. I think that's got months to play out, but this is this is a good number. Again, it feeds into that broader inflation narrative, which I think is all moving in the direction. And, and you know, we're pretty bullish on markets, right? I do think this sort of rates and inflation shock that you saw last year is absolutely going to fade. I think you're seeing a big recovery in China, which we don't talk about enough, but I think is a huge insurance policy against the global recession. And, and tech, which is by far the biggest sector in the market, I think is not going to lead up this year, but is going to have a less bad year this year than last year. And I think, given its size, uh, it's going to be very important of, of how this year plays out. Yeah, we were actually discussing within tech some of the indicators to look for to really signal that the sector is ready for some type of, of bounce back. Uh, but one of the projections that we received yesterday was that uh, we shouldn't look for that return uh, in full force until the back half of 2024, which at that point would put us into an election year. And, and we know the tendency or the propensity for markets to kind of be sideways and just kind of flat barely to the upside even uh, in some of those general election years. I think this is going to be a different year for tech. So last year was all about valuations being crushed and earnings being pretty resilient. I think this year is going to be about earnings maybe not being crushed, but earnings certainly leading the market on the way down. And I think you're going to start seeing that in the fourth quarter numbers when we forget how cyclical um, some bits of tech are. And the, you know, that $50,000 Tesla or that, you know $1,000 iPhone is, is ultimately a discretionary purchase, which many of us don't need to make. And I think that's going to continue to weigh. But I think the relief is going to come from valuations. You've had a complete turnaround in valuations in, in the last 12 months. And I think as we get to the top of this Fed cycle, as bond yields stay where they are or maybe come down a bit, I think that's where you're going to see the relief, which is the key ingredient, I think, to tech not having a repeat of its terrible 2022. Um, terrible, but will it be down, Ben? Because if you indeed were recommending buying tech stocks right here, I won't say you're alone in the wilderness, but you don't have too many friends there with you. Yeah, I mean, let, let, let's go now to ahead of our skis here, right? I do think the bottom for the market is in. I do think, call it the first quarter, where it's going to be choppy, right? This is this transition period as we get more visibility on um, inflation decisively coming down, especially those sticky bits of inflation on top of the Fed cycle. So I think, you know, that first quarter is going to have echoes of 2022, you know, lots of volatility, you know, two steps forward, one step back. So, you know, keep it reasonably defensive. I think the things that worked in 2022 will continue to work in 2023. But the more we move further that, the more this market, I think, is going to de-risk and you can take more risk. And that's tech, that's small cap, uh, that's growth, um, essentially the things that just got absolutely crushed last year. So, so does that mean energy still in, in 2023? I think energy is going to be fine, but it's not going to lead, right? Uh, you know, commodities has been the big outperformer for the last two years, I don't think you're going to see that third year. Um, I think um, this is a year when commodities takes a little bit more of a backseat. I think it's pretty well supported. I mean, you know, the supply side is very, very tight. China's recovering. But I think, you know, demand overall will be lower this year than it was. Uh, demand growth will be lower this year than it was last year. So I think commodities will take will be fine. But I, I don't think we're going to see a third year of leadership. Ben Layler, eToro Global Market Strategies. Good to see you. Have a good weekend. A stat of the day here. Uh, if a recession is on the horizon, history shows that fixed income is a pretty solid place to hide out. Bonds return more than 10% on average during recessions, according to data from our friend uh, Liz Young over at SoFi. Shares of Amazon are on the move after the tech giant confirmed it will be cutting over 18,000 jobs, far more than originally expected. Our next guest is warning that Amazon has the most downside in 2023 due to cost headwinds and the potential for slowing consumption. Jeffrey's analyst Brent Thill joins us now. Brent, always good to see you. Uh, pretty sizable cuts here by Amazon. Do you think that is their initial down payment and we should expect more cuts from them in the months ahead? Expect more cuts for the rest of tech in the front half. The outlook uh, is getting worse. Uh, Microsoft CEO yesterday delivered a message that it's going to be two years before the ne next big tech inflection. That is from one of the most honest and upfront individuals that I know in the industry for the last 20 years. It's a very sobering outlook, and I don't know how to put this, but it, we're headed to a recession. Uh, uh, Jeffrey's internal economists believe that 
this is going to start later and last longer. That is not good news. And so I think ultimately we're just seeing the beginning of, of what's to happen. Salesforce yesterday, uh, again, big layoff, Elastic, Stitch Fix, I think today had a, a big layoff. You look at across the board what's happening in tech and e-com, it's, it's very sobering and it's not good and it's not a great sign of, of future demand. So uh, ultimately, I think we overhired as an industry into the you know into the pandemic the pandemic created an artificial bubble pulled demand forward and then uh we come out of it and we have a hangover and then we head right to a recession so that is just a toxic buildup, and it's going to take a while for that to stabilize that then puts us at when's the next rebound is it 2024 in in nadella's terms this might be 2025. And so in the in the short term, companies have no other choice but to tighten their belts, get back to growth at, at a profitable uh, measure. Most of, of tech is growing with no regard to profitability, and that has to change because investors will drive those stocks to zero if they don't uh, produce profitable growth. And so not a great outlook. Sorry to be so sober. Yeah, no, it's a really sobering picture that we're all trying to wrap our heads around. And so with that in mind, part of what we had seen in terms of the issues for Salesforce was this issue of headcount, uh, well, seat count compression, I should say, rather, and how much that actually might be a larger industry issue that we should just be waiting for the shoe to drop at other companies to give their updates on that similar basis. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. So if you continue to lay people off and, and Salesforce and others are seat based, you need less seats. And theoretically, you, you create shelfware, if you will, and that will sit around. And, and, and so as companies rehire, they may not have to actually bring back as many seats um, as they come back up. So again, this uh, is a situation that we haven't seen for a long time. And ultimately, uh, again, I think the pandemic, uh, every tech company tried to do to help everyone become virtual and remote. And and unfortunately, now you've got that unwinding, you've got the economy unwinding. And so the good news for tech is that multiples have compressed. And we're now seeing multiples that are, you know, in many cases, uh, back at trough levels. And then the question now is how, how much lower do numbers and earnings have to go before we start to see stabilization? In our coverage, close to 80 to 90 percent of technology companies will show a deceleration in growth in 2023, and tech stocks don't work in decelerating growth. And so uh, we 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 believe in the mullet trade, you know, which is front half business not not really exciting, back half flowy, long, exciting. Um, so we believe in the mullet trade. I think most of our clients are believing in the mullet trade where it's kind of business in front, party in back. Hopefully that plays out. It, it may end up just being a dragged out, really tough 2023 is the risk. And it may, uh, it may end up being, you know, a, a back half 24 reemergence from, from this rather than sometime in, in early next year. So Again, I think the, the picture, at least from our economists, continues to get worse. I am listening to our internal economists because they have been in front of the puck on this. And I've listened to them and it saved me um, from being too too bullish. But tactically, I think there's only one way you can lean, mm -hmm. which is when you have a CEO of the most admired company in tech, Microsoft, say it's two years before another tech inflection um, that that sums it up right there. Yeah, you you listen to him. Um, I'm going to be waiting, Brent, for you to to get the hairdo to match the the strategy here. He needs to do a little growing in the back. Um, so okay, business in the front, party in the back. What does that mean in terms of what companies fall into each of those categories? So I think when you think about uh, internet names, have been hit the hardest because they are immediate revenue streams. They you feel it like if if you don't if you don't buy four hundred dollar Lego set, it shows up immediately in Amazon's numbers. It doesn't show up in Microsoft's numbers because they have recurring revenue that's on a subscription basis. It takes time for that to unwind. So I do think that some of the internet names are feeling it first. Are probably going to trough first and probably come out of this. Um, semiconductors are semi analysts has been very clear that the 
all the adoption from Meta around AI is going to benefit NVIDIA uh, and, and other companies that are in, in, embedding in, in you know, artificial and ML into their platforms. That will, will help NVIDIA. So uh, our semi-analyst belief is that NVIDIA and some of these other names are probably at the front end and they've had number, numerous number cuts. So perhaps semis and the internet will be the ones that come back first. I think software still has some lag because they have recurring contracts and it takes time for that to unwind before you see the weakness. And so I think we we believe semis and internet may lead us out. Software will probably be a lagging indicator. We talk about black ice. Um, we are we are obviously seeing black ice today um, in, in a lot of these tech names in, in the market today. So I, I'd say um, if you think about in the back half of the year, I think a lot of the small and mid cap software names will do very well. They're trained at a massive discount to uh, 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 M&A, uh, Tomo Bravo, Vista, uh, a number of the, the PE shops have been taking out companies at a 50%, 60, 70, 80% premium to where current stocks are trading now. So back half of the year, we believe will be good for small and mid. And I think for large cap, you know, they're they're just, they're still unwinding. So I, I, I'm actually a little more bullish about small and mid. So are our strategists internally, Jeffries, around small and mid cap. Their coiled springs in the back half of the year. But again, I, I want to be very clear. I think the front half is going to be a lot of pain and use an opportunity to buy into the pain. And, and potentially, again, I think for longer term holders, this is this is going to be a great recovery over the next two years. This year, again, it, it is we're kind of stuck in the swamp, if you will. There's going to be some pockets of up. But I, again, I, I, I don't see a great picture in the front half of the year. And it, and it may continue, and we may end up coming back to you and saying, we don't see a great picture for all of 23, and it may really just end up being the the the, the, the party in the back with the mullet comes in, in 24. Brian, you mentioned uh, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella and his latest warning this week. Well, does that make Microsoft shares dead money for the next two years? It's an unbelievable, it's the best house in, the, in a bad neighborhood. So I think the answer for largely tech, we're stuck in, in a tight training range. Um, to answer your question, we like Microsoft long-term. We we have a $270 price target. We think this is one of the best franchises, one of the best management teams, one of the most ethical, just upstanding. You know, again, I think Nadella wins the award for the most admired person in, 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 in my industry. And so I go back to, you want a leader like him to lead through what's going on. And I have a huge, a huge admiration. I think, unfortunately, short term, a lot of these names are stuck. And if you believe in a $10 earnings number for Microsoft, it's hard to argue that you're going to put anything past the 25 multiple. That would be $250 in the stock. And so we think, again, Microsoft stuck between a 200 to $250 range. If you took a 20 to 20, 25 multiple on earnings, and again, stock you're showing right now at 224, we're kind of we're stuck right in the middle of that. So that would suggest to your your point to answer your question, it it's kind of stuck in the short term until we have a breakout uh, on what's happening in the overall environment. Yeah, I'm I'm interested to see what uh, Bing plus Chat GPT looks like, but that's a whole nother conversation. Brent Thill, um, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Um, sobering words, as you said, on what's going on in tech right now. Appreciate it. Well, there's not necessarily much investors are agreeing on this year, but a lot of people are looking to the fixed income market as having a comeback in 2023. PIMCO Managing Director and Portfolio Manager Sonali Peer joins us now to discuss. Sonali, this has been one of the refrains that we have been hearing from investors. Why are people feeling so good about the bond market for this year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, after a tough 2022, it really has changed the landscape where yields are today. Of course, on the back of the, the Fed hiking rates. And, you know, today, if you look at the yields, even on 10-year treasuries, for example, there's positive yields that, you know, there wasn't long ago where we're talking about the stock of negative yielding assets. Today, not only have yields improved dramatically, but there's also providing a fair amount of income. So despite potential volatility in 2022, there's a lot of room now, uh, 2023, a lot of room now for income producing assets. And as you look out the curve, even out to credit markets, we can pick up even additional yield. And you believe that the bulk of the Fed rate increases is behind us. And I mean, largely, we would all hope that it certainly is given the kind of extent that they did raise last year. But what would that volatility that you were mentioning 
mentioning, what would that really hinge on in terms of their tenor and any type of rate increases that they continue to move forward with? Yeah, so from a Fed perspective, we do think the bulk of the move is behind us and, and you know, that, but yet volatility is likely to stay. And part of that has to do with the recession probability. You know, our base case is that we would likely see a um, mild recession, but one that's longer and shallower than, say, what we saw in the V-shaped uh, recession and recovery in 2020. Mm. Um, as a result, there's still a lot of volatility potential from an employment perspective as well as from a growth perspective. In a recession, what areas of the corporate bond market do you think would get hit this year? Yeah, you know, where we're most concerned, even though, you know, if you look at the public credit markets, there has been a fair amount of improvement on the back of, you know, the 2020 peak pandemic experience being rather recent, many companies have raised a lot of debt go, you know, in the back half of 2020 and in 2021 to help weather that storm. But where we're most concerned really has to do with areas where there's low multiples on those businesses, low margins, high cyclicality, where you know, it's very difficult to weather a storm like a recession um, when you have those types of things you know, against you, as well as still inflation. Sounds like retail. Impact. Retail is a big Retail would be one, autos, mm -hmm. wire lines, you know, some areas where you're just continuing to see declines, even to some, some slow, some faster, but due to a shift in investor uh, demand, as well as disruption from the supply chain. So it sounds like even though you want to get your yield right now, you don't want to take on too much risk in order to get that yield. Is that fair to say? I think that's absolutely right. You know, where we're looking at opportunities really is because that fixed income has really repriced. Um, you know, but knowing that there's potential volatility ahead, it's really doing it for a long-term hold or for, you know, kind of scaling in at these higher yields for that income producing aspect of fixed income, as well as the fact that it will be less volatile typically in a recession than equity. So, you know, you're getting some cash flow along the way and then you're subduing some of that volatility relative to equity markets in a recession. So looking at investment grade, high quality parts of high yield, um, rather than say distress just yet. Mm -hmm. For investors that are just looking to find confidence coming out of 2022 and, and moving on into 2023 here, in their portfolio, where could they position or at least find one of those sources of confidence in the markets? Yeah, you know, I think areas that, that I, I, we believe that, you know, if you, even if you look at it from a long-term history of percentile of spreads and you look at, you know, the low probability of default. So, for example, you know, a sweet spot may be those triple Bs within investment grade, for example, where, you know, dollar prices have come down a lot as a, as a result of the interest rates rising, as well as credit spreads having widened. But again, you know, we're, we're looking at this as an opportunity in more of the defensive sectors, a longer term hold um, where, you know, it, there, we do still expect that volatility in at least the first half of 2023, if not throughout. Stanley, thanks so much. It's a really interesting time. People are not used to seeing yields like this. So some definite opportunities out there. Stanley Pierre of PIMCO, thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome back, everyone. Keeping tabs on futures this morning. You've got some up activity here with about 14 minutes until the start of today's trading session, the first of the new year as investors await to, uh, they're awaiting a busy start to 2023. More on the year ahead. TD Securities Managing Director, Global Head of Rates Strategy, Priya Misra joins us now. Happy New Year to you, first and foremost, Priya. First, as we kind of get into this new trading session of the new year, um, what would you be looking for in terms of just what we expect at this point in time? I mean, we've, we've discussed at length what is going to carry over from 2022, but what is the top thing that you'd be looking out for? Sure. Happy New Year. Thanks for having me on. You know, I think the focus last year, I think some of that focus remains this year, which is going to be on economic data and the uh, central bank response function. And I would say globally, but particularly for the U.S., we've got a lot of data over the next week. So we'll be watching particularly that that payrolls report, wages. I think the key question is inflation may have peaked, but how quickly is it going to decline? Is it going to get closer to 2% by the end of this year, which will allow the Fed to start to respond to uh, to a slowing growth picture. Now, in our view, inflation is going to be sticky. You know, getting down from 7% to 4% might be easier, but getting from that 4 or 3 down to 2, I think is going to take a while. And so our view is that as the economy slows down, which we do expect a recession in the third quarter, um, that the Fed is going to struggle to respond. And I think that tension between inflation and how quickly it declines, how quickly is the unemployment rate rising, I think that's going to be with us in a market that is less liquid. And I think 
think conviction levels are not very high. So I think we're going to see large moves. I mean, today you look at the bond market. We've had pretty big moves already the first day of the year. So I think that 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 just tells us there's uncertainty. There's a lot of cross currents here. And I should bring up the global issue as well. What's Japan doing with, with YCC? How does ECB QT take over? I think all of that we're going to be grappling with. Even though the year's turned, I think a lot of this, those same themes will stay with us uh, for the rest of this year. Yeah, a big a big move to start off the year indeed and sort of a return to, I don't know, maybe what investors are looking for for this year, but we'll see what ends up happening. We talk about the Fed and how it's going to struggle to react. You're looking at a terminal rate that's higher than what the market is pricing in. Um, does that reflect that struggle and what the Fed has telegraphed that is its willingness to sort of go hard against inflation, maybe at the cost of growth? Exactly. And I should say that growth right now is strong. We just had data over the last two weeks that shows that the consumer is still spending, you know, and, and the labor market is very tight. So the Fed really, I think, has sort of a one way trade to continue to raise rates until they see service inflation wages starting to come down. I think that dilemma for the Fed will actually grow in the second half, because by then the unemployment rate rises to the point where you know, they should start to ease policy and will inflation allow them to ease. But for now, I think they're telling us that December Fed meeting was very hawkish and we're going to get the minutes this week tomorrow. So we're actually waiting to see what we hear from the minutes. But the dots came in much higher than market pricing. And I think the market's calling the Fed's bluff a little bit. But they remain very focused on inflation and they need that service inflation. I think the focus will shift from CPI and core CPI to service CPI and wages. And that, I think, is just very sticky because the labor market remains tight. Will inflation reach a point this year that will allow the Federal Reserve to cut rates? So I think it's both. The, we do think inflation comes down. We don't think it gets all the way down to a two-handle. You know, we've got 3.1 by the end of the year. So it's declining. It's moved a long way. But I think then there'll be we'll be looking at the labor market as well. If the unemployment rate is close to five in our forecast by the end of the year, and you've got inflation still above target, but we've done a lot of work. We do think the Fed starts to cut rates. So we've penciled in the first cut in December of this year, but then we have 225 basis points of guns penciled in for next year, because by then the labor market is weak enough that the Fed may have to start to say, look, we've gone from inflation being public enemy number one to the labor market. And I think then they can start to respond. So I think we have to be looking at that unemployment rate as well. Three handle or even four and a half. The Fed's own forecast has 4.7. There, you know, I think it needs to be much worse than 4.7 for the Fed to start to respond by cutting rates. If we do see the Fed start to cut rates, what indications do you believe that they will need to see in order to ensure that inflation doesn't once again uh, try or even spark back up even after they make that type of pivot? Right. Yes. I think that's going to be a key thing they're going to be watching. They're really terrified. What I call the ghost of the 70s still haunts them, mm. meaning they, do, they don't want to be early in responding to the slowdown. So I think they'll be watching inflation expectations. You know, the Michigan survey, we, we look at all sorts of uh, survey measures for inflation expectations, consumer as well as market based. They'll want to see that being stable. And then I think it's going to come down to services and wages. Uh, if wages have downshifted, we're not looking at 5% wage growth, but three and a half or even four, I think they can say, look, wages are starting to come off. And so some of that pressure on service inflation is declining. And we'll be also watching for consumer spending. These are all early signs. If the consumer savings buffer, accumulated savings is down and the consumer spending starts to go down, you would think inflation follows next. So I think they're gonna look at a bunch of things to make sure they are not early. I actually think the Fed was late to start to hike and I think they're gonna be late to start to cut because they are so worried that they might let inflation, ex might stoke inflation expectations. And then it's very hard to bring that inflation back down. TD Securities Managing Director and Global Head of Rate Strategy, Priya Misra. Good to see you uh, as always. Happy New Year. Thank you. Fears of a recession are looming across the country. Yahoo Finance's Jenna Heron joins us now with tips on how to prepare yourself financially in the event of a downturn. Jenna, what's the first thing people should do to get ready? Sure. And you know what? Happy almost New Year to you, Jared. Yes. Um, but yeah, so I know people are probably a little worried that there's a recession coming and what that might mean for their finances. So the first thing I think people should do 
is actually take stock of their financial situation. And I would actually recommend this regardless of whether you're worried about a recession. It's a great time of the year to really figure out what, what money is going in and what money is going out. So what is your financial situation? That includes what are your essential bills? So what do you spend on housing? Your car payment, if you need your car to get to work, your health insurance, your utilities and food. Those are the essentials, right? You need to make sure you have money to always meet those bills. Then tally up your other bills. So how much do you spend on that other stuff? Like, you know, going out, um, your credit card debt, your subscriptions, your streaming services, cable. Um, these are kinds of expenses that can either be eliminated altogether or cut down. And it's good to know what those are. Then take a uh, tally of your cash on hand. So what do you have in your checking account? What do you have in your savings account? Do you have any money floating around in CDs? So know what you have there. And then last, what are the other sources of cash that you might be able to tap? And it might be a little bit harder. So if you own your home, can you get a home equity line of credit or a home equity loan? Do you have a certain type of life insurance policy that allows you to withdraw money early or take a loan? Um, what about your retirement accounts? Does your employer allow you to take a loan against your 401k? Um, so you wanna really gather a good picture of where your finances are and where you can go to if you run into trouble. And Jenna, we hear lots of talk about an emergency fund exactly for a time like this, when times get tough. I guess people want to know, and I'm curious, how much should people be allocating towards their emergency fund? And any tips if people don't have one and are looking to build one pretty quickly? Yeah, emergency funds, really great to have. It really gives you peace of mind. The rule of thumb is to have three to six months of your expenses saved up. Um, you want to be closer to that six month goal if you're a one income household. Um, you can be at that three month goal if you have more than uh, one person with uh, making income. So, but here's the thing, that sounds like a lot of money and it's really hard to get past that. So don't get overwhelmed. Start small by trying to save um, the amount of your largest bill first. So that would likely be your, your mortgage or your rent. So if you lose your job, you look in your emergency fund, you're like, hey, you know what? At least I have next month's rent or mortgage paid. And that gives you a little bit of a buffer. After that, then try to get one month of expenses saved up. So start small and don't feel discouraged that you don't have the whole kit and caboodle. Now, how do you go about building an emergency fund? Um, it's almost tax season, guys, but you know what that means? A lot of people are going to get a tax refund. And that is a good chunk of money to put away to start your um, emergency fund. Uh, you might also get a bonus from work. That's another place where you can jumpstart that emergency fund. And if you have any side gigs or things like that, then you can start allocating some of that money to your emergency fund. So those are some quick ways to really build up uh, that those savings that you can tap in case things go wrong. And Jenna, we've heard a lot about layoffs, mainly concentrated in the tech sector, but there are, there are concerns as the Fed is raising rates that they're also going to engineer a recession. So if a person, if somebody out there is worried about losing their job, uh, what advice do you have for them? What may be in their control? Yeah, so I mean, I don't worry about, one of the things you don't, you can't control is if your company is going to lay, have layoffs, right? So what you need to think about is how you can position yourself if you lose your job. So one of the things I would say to do is update your resume and your LinkedIn profile. And I would do this now before you lose your job because there's gonna be a lot of other things that you have to deal with after you lose a job. So you might not feel like doing, oh, an update on my resume or my LinkedIn profile at that time. Um, don't let your network go, go stale. You know. Talk with people, make sure um, you're asking about job openings, other places, uh, just keep everybody, keep in touch with everybody. So when you, if not when, if you do lose your job, um, you can tap them and ask them if, if there are any openings where they are working. Um, the other thing I would say is to make sure your skills or certifications are updated before anything bad could happen. So take advantage of any new training that your company offers right now um, to beef up that resume, or if you have to take some classes to get some certifications up to date, make sure to do that before things go south. 
Very important tips here for all of our viewers. Jenna Heron, thanks so much, and Happy New Year to you. Thanks.